you know, when I say don't go to America, I was there. They say don't go to Stanford. I was there. All those things have lost their luster. They're in a decline. If China and East Asia is visual, India is verbal. The moment that Americans were saying, oh my God, you're so immoral for not supporting Ukraine by sanctioning Russia, Indians had 50 arguments ready to go. Palki Sharma. Yeah. Palki Sharma is another one. You know, takes nothing, you know, and she'll give it back, right? Dashum, dashum, you know? <laughs> See, I know that one, right? The West, its vision of the future is Black Mirror. India's vision of the future should be Bright Sun. Thing, just like China realized it no longer needs to look up to the US, India no longer needs to look up to China or the US. I have not had too many guests where I just shut up and listen. This is part two of a geopolitics special with Balaji Srinivasan. He's one of the most dense minds that I've ever had on the show. For regular podcast listeners, you know who Balaji S is. For those people who are meeting Balaji S for the first time on TRS, sit down, enjoy, get ready to absorb one of the world's most respected minds this is part two. Ideally, check out part one. But even if you haven't, you know what? You're going to get to learn a lot on today's episode. On a very human level, why have you come back here? Why have I come back Why here? has Balaji come back here? Fundamentally, because, yeah. Because like, I mean, is it because you feel a sense of cultural patriotism of sorts? Like, what are you trying to do? Do you see business opportunity? Like, I want to get to yes. your heart and not just your mind. No, totally, totally, totally. It's, a, it's both a push and a pull, okay? Um, so fundamentally, I do really think um, it's, it's no one variable. It's a combination of variables. But let me describe each of those variables, okay? So first, the positive ones, okay? I do believe that this decade is to India what the 2010s were to China, okay? This is absolutely like, you know, India's time to rise. And I actually think this century, just like the 20th century when all the dust settled was the US versus USSR, I kind of think this century when the whole dust settles will be sort of the, um, the, the internet with India being a big part of it versus centralized China. Ooh, that's actually the second Cold War, Oof. right? I think the U.S. is like the British Empire and just going to kind of face plan, which is that's a, that's a negative part, right? So for go ahead. No, nope, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go on. But I'll come back to that part. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's like a twenty forty ish kind of vision, like twenty years out. Okay, but um, and I can tell why I think that. But so a um, the execute basically. As an angel investor, as a VC, you know, I'm attuned to looking for these curves that have a strength to them, but they're still early in their ascent. They're still underpriced in a certain sense, right? In India, it totally feels like that to me. You know, um, it is getting better press and stuff now in the West, but for a long time when I talk about it and I, you know, when I get back, by the way, uh, when I get back, I'm just going to tweet out some videos of the airport here and be like, where is this airport? I'm just ask people. They're like, is this Changi? Is this, you know, Dubai? No, this is India, baby. <laughs> right? And it's not just one airport. There's a bunch of them, right? Mm. I mean, the new Bangalore airport is competitive with Changi, right? Mm. It's like, it's a absolutely world class, okay? That kind of stuff does really matter in terms of, you know, people seeing that and understanding that. But even given that, it's still underpriced, okay? So that's a big thing. That's the single biggest driver. The second is uh, culturally, like, yes, you're right that for a long time, the highest press, I, I agree that from, I don't know, 1965 to 2019-ish, right, that the optimal strategy for, a, a, you know, a talented Indian was probably to leave, to go to the US or, you know, UK or something like that. Yes, right? I don't think that's the optimal strategy anymore. I think you can be in India, or if you're emigrating, you can go to Dubai or Singapore or something like that. You don't have to go to the USA, right? If you do go to the USA, stay out of the blue cities because they're unsafe and they're going to get worse. I can't believe I'm hearing this publicly, but go on. Okay, like really? You're actually telling Indian parents not to send their kids. Don't. And I say this, by the way, I have all the traditional credentials, okay? Stanford PhD, you know, Stanford BSMS PhD, taught CS and Stats at Stanford, 
every standardized test I've maxed, I perfected every standardized test, okay? Everything that Indian parents care about, I, you know, I, I did, right? And um, so, so I have all of those legacy credentials, right? I, I think insofar as that matters. So it's not like, you know, when I say don't go to America, I came, I, we were, I was there, right? I say don't go to Stanford, right? I was there. All those things have lost their luster. They're in a decline. And India is now able to set its own path. That's the other thing. Just like China realized it no longer needs to look up to the US, India no longer needs to look up to China or the US. It can look at them and see what things are good, but it definitely shouldn't model its society after the US. Mm. It has a more functional society now in some ways. Again, that, that $75 million probe versus the $300 million bus lane shows that it's a more functional society. It's not just that, of course. It's $125 million for the parliament building versus like billions of dollars in waste for um, like actually just the, just the embassy for the US and Vietnam alone is like like more than a billion, right? For some 125 for the parliament building. She's talking 10, 100 X price differentials, which indicate also whether a society can get it together and is smart, right? What, I mean, here's one model, it's not exactly right, but for many years, I mean, the Middle East actually improved a lot today. It's secularized and so on and so forth. I'm actually quite bullish on it. But for many years, the U.S. knew that it had an economic relationship with the Middle East, but didn't want to emulate them culturally. That's how India should think of America. Hmm. You have an economic relationship. They're a market. You don't bother them. You need to understand it, but you don't want to trek that culture back home. Okay. okay? Um, that is like, because the culture that just leads to, right now, like a tearing apart of society and so on and so forth, right? Um so, and it's unfortunate. Uh, that wasn't always the case. I think for many years, American values were good to, you know, emulate. They, there was fair play in the handshake and, you know, the C Corp and so on and so forth. Internet values have now taken over from American values. Okay. That's the thing is if I'm at a tech conference, I mentioned this the other day, if I'm at a tech conference in Dubai or in India or in Singapore, does it really make sense to talk about Western values or American values when I'm there, Right. If everybody in the room is non-white or non-American or both, right? What are we really talking about there, right? The, the backdrop, yes, it's it's tech. But on the other hand, people are gesturing at some kind of, there is something there, right? That, that people all share. And they share it with somebody in the San Francisco conference room as well. It's not Western values, it's internet values. And, and just to explain what this is, much further back in history, people used to talk about like Europe and Christendom, right? And that was how they delineated what their culture was. Then... As you had the Enlightenment and the rise of America, people started talking about the West. And it was a more secular way of talking about, you know, free speech and free markets and all that type of stuff, right? But now today in America, the Democrats run tons of articles talking about how, you know, New York Times had an article, free speech is killing us. Okay, so the left has turned on free, free speech and the right is against free markets because they're not winning the trade war. So what are Western values then, right? It's not free speech, it's not free markets. Those are being rejected. Um, it's not like, you know, a firm handshake and rule of law. Like those are both being rejected on both sides, right? In many ways, uh, I mean, I can go example for example, it's hard. You, you might not even have 50% of the USA saying they agree with Western values because many people have been through colleges where they have deconstructed Western civilization and said it's all stale, white male, pales, you know, whatever. Okay. Right. So, so what, what do you have left? What you have is internet values. And internet values are to the West what the West was to like Christendom. It's like a more broad way of thinking about it that's actually what you want to emulate, right? So the part of, of quote, the US that you still want to emulate are the tech companies. And media? No. No? No. And the reason is uh, social media, yes. Social influence. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think I'm doing a good job with my podcast overall. Yes, you are. Yeah. Um, not this one, like the podcast in general with the Hindi podcast as well. I've modeled myself on Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss. Yeah, but they're, okay, sure, sure, sure. So th that's internet media. Basically, internet first. That is that is what I think India, so um, India has a domestic ideology, okay? And that's BJP and, and, so, and that's fine, right? What is the global ideology, right? The thing is, in the U.S., people, because um, the U.S.'s posture in the world is relatively declining, you're getting this narrative of America first, right? Which comes from a sense of, okay, we we're we're losing here, we're getting screwed, we're we're doing stuff for the rest of the world. We start better start looking for, uh, out for ourselves first, okay? 
The thing is, I understand where that comes from. I'm sympathetic to it in some ways. But America first also means Turkey will say Turkey first, and Brazil will say Brazil first, and everybody else will say themselves first. And then if everybody's first, then you have no cooperation. You don't have a world order, right? And of course, China will say China first. They didn't want America first, right? The entire structure of the US setup, it's like the CEO is like, okay, there's less money. I'm going to start taking all of it for myself, right? And that makes everybody else mad. And so it's just something where they're using their position while they still have it, right? Pro-America doesn't mean being America first. I think the alternative model is actually internet first. Mm. Why do I say internet first? Um, again, we aren't yet conceptualizing the internet as a political space, right? We're still in this transitional stage where all politics, all media, all communication, all transaction happens through the internet. We don't think of it as a thing in its own right. Do you know what I mean? It's like this weird transitional era. Go ahead. What I'm not understanding is your vision of the internet. Okay, let me okay, like, let me talk about that. How will it become political? Okay. Well, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um first an analogy that's a little easier to get, and then we get the all right. Sure. So when the British colonists were in uh, America, they thought of themselves as British for a long time. And it took a while before they realized, wait a second. We're in our, they almost thought of themselves as like a, a, a long commute from London. Okay. It's just like a long commute. I'm in, I'm in an outer borough. Okay. Right. So, uh, plus they were also dependent on it for that transatlantic voyage, the supply chain and stuff they depended upon London and so on. Eventually they became locally, um, you know, self-sufficient, but it took generations for them to realize, oh, we're kind of our own people. And we're our own people and we've got our own land, but our government is thousands of miles away. Why shouldn't it be here? Okay. And it just took a while for that penny to drop and for them to be strong enough in themselves and have enough internal cohesion where they were friends with all other people on American soil and not, they didn't really know the British. So they became a, um, their own self-connected network and they weren't connected with that legacy network over here. And that took some time to happen. Okay. With me so far. That yeah. led to the Declaration of Independence and the breaking away. All right. So now, um, how does the internet fit that? Okay. Because we don't think of the internet as a place in the same way, but it has half the aspects of a place. Here's why. Uh, think about how many people, so take, take your WhatsApp or something like that, right? Anybody here can do this as an exercise. Take that last hundred people that you went and communicated with, all right? And ask yourself, um, how many of them are you know on my block? How many of them are in my city? How many are in my country? Okay. And how about the last hundred people you transacted with and so on as well, right? And if you made a map of all those people, okay, are they around the world or are they in your city or are they in your country? Around the world. Around the world, okay. If they're around the world, that means that uh, the hundred people who are physically near you in, in this apartment building, right? Um, or like if you live in an apartment building, there's a hundred people who are physically near you, but they're cognitively very far away. Mm. And then you instead have a hundred people who are cognitively very near you and you're just a few seconds away in terms of communication, but they're physically very far. Okay. That is the key thing that the internet has done because you can have all four combinations. They can be physically close and mentally close. They can be uh, physically close and mentally far, like the guy in the apartment, you know, a few, few feet away that we don't even know, okay? They can be physically far and uh, mentally close, right? Which is your friend who's somewhere else. And then they can be, um, I forgot the last one, physically far and mentally far, just somebody you, far away <laughs> you never met, okay? It's the off diagonals that really matter because we, the entire nation state concept uh, where you have a map of the world and it's cut into little rectangles. That's based on the idea that people who are near each other physically are near each other mentally. When that is not true, that's not actually how you want to do political organization. Gotcha. If, because basically the assumption is if you're near each other physically, you share the same culture. When that's not true, then you get conflict, right? And you get reorganization and so on. Now, what China has done on this is they have said, okay, we want to reduce the internet's fragmenting and fracturing impact on our society. Therefore, we're blocking foreign social media. We're setting up the Great Firewall. We're making sure that Chinese can't make friends with people way ab abroad. 
So when when you take that question that I said and you apply it to China, they will have some people that they're going to be communicating with abroad, but they're their own Galapagos Islands where they can basically only transact communicate with other Chinese people. So it's at least within greater China, right? For the most part. WeChat is kind of an internal Chinese thing. So they're keeping their cloud and their land correlated. Mm. Okay. Mm. So China is focused on keeping like a centralized kind of state. Um, in the US, what you have is you have people who live in the same apartment building, like a few feet away from each other, who have totally different media diets, totally different values. And how are they going to vote together to even paint a bus lane? They're not. This is the new democracy versus communism. Yeah. What it was in the last hundred years. This is going to be the new version of that. Yes. So I call it the network versus state. Gotcha. So right? one's physically near and mentally near and one's physically near and mentally extremely far. Yeah. Well, right. Or basically, or it is, it's physical as the, as the state. It's like the in-person and then digital and mental is the cloud. Gotcha. Right. Or the network. Go ahead. Is the best pathway a sort of combination of the yes, two? Yes, I or, think so. Or we don't know the best pathway. Well, so I, I, well, I do think it'll have to be a combination of the two. Because if you run a country without having the skills of a software CEO, you won't run that country. Okay. You'll eventually lose control of that country because the network will metabolize. The network will dissolve your political and financial support. Like you need to have those people in the cloud who can communicate among themselves, kind of lining up with what you're doing on the land. And if they're not, then you've got a problem. Can I can I put forward some points first? And again, correct me where you feel I'm wrong, et cetera, yes. et cetera. The podcast has gotten super political lately. I never thought I'll enter the world of Indian politics because I was just advised not to. And I think it's the best thing that I've done. Uh, I made the mistake of having four cabinet ministers back to back on the show. Okay. So now I got labeled as what the world could understand as right wing. Like in the same way that Joe Rogan gets labeled as a, sure. a Repub Republican, I think I had the Indian version of that. Mm -hmm. So the entire urban uh, anti-Modi side, okay, uh, now doesn't listen to me, is fully against me. Okay. They think I stand for uh, anti-secular sentiments, which is not true at all. Uh, I got maybe two or three politicians from the anti-Modi side. So in India, we don't have right and left. We have pro-Modi and anti-Modi. Okay. That's yeah. the truth. Uh, the urban elite are extremely inspired by the US. And I think that because the US is so polarized and this whole social dilemma angle where even algorithms are making you more polarized, the same thing applies to urban India. If you actually go to the rural parts of India, people don't have political opinions that are that strong. And I'm saying that because I've actually gone there. I don't think a lot of urban people have gone there. And I've gone there because of my YouTube career, blogging, etc. Um, okay, so this is kind of like the political vibe in the country. Uh, my reading after talking to people from both sides is that there's capability on both the pro-Modi side and the anti-Modi side. The anti-Modi side or the Congress was in power for the longest time yes. over the last century. Uh, there were some phases which were good, some phases which were bad. The anti-Modi side believes that the pro-Modi side is completely bad. The pro-Modi side believes that the anti-Modi side is completely bad. My reading is that because of the size of the population, and because of how hungry and patriotic and emotional Indians are, any government in power would probably hire the right people and still make the country grow in this mm. phase. Again, these two sides don't agree. I'm kind of giving you sure. a bit of a centrist yes. narrative. Yep. Okay. But all in all, when I speak to influential people in India, they're for the pro-Modi side because it brings stability to the country. And that's how the rest of the world, especially people like yourself, people who have the money, look at India. That if there is a stable government, hey, we'll work more uh, with this country. Uh, in saying that, now there are some narratives like Virdas had this whole two Indias thing that went viral in India. I don't know how viral it went in US. It didn't reach you. So probably it yeah. didn't go as viral. You know Virdas is? Sorry. Really? No. He's a very respected Indian stand-up comic, but he's very clearly like anti-Modi. Okay. And he does represent a very large chunk of urban India. A lot okay. of urban India is anti-Modi. I've come to realize that everyone's an outcome of social media algorithms and anyone on the extremes is not right. They don't have a clear vision of what's happening. Okay. It's that whole horseshoe magnet theory that if you're on the end, you're actually closer to each other than the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, is it true that people like yourself view 
PM Modi as a positive for the country and what whatever his government is doing is doing as a positive for the country. I'll lay out my positives. Yes, we've seen closer. infrastructure growth, especially in the interiors of the country, in urban parts of the country. It's not the perfect government. There, I mean, the government has its flaws. Um, one hundred percent. See, a pol- politician's career is divided into two parts: win the elections mm-hmm. and then governance and administration. I actually think the Modi government gets most of governance and administration right. And this is after talking to people from the anti-Modi side as well. I don't think their arguments are strong enough, at least for me. Uh, what they get wrong is on the election side. One of the easiest political tools that can be used is religion. You can use religion to influence a lot of people. In the last nine years, I have felt a huge increase in inter-community tension. The Muslims, the Christians, the Sikhs in our country don't feel as safe as they used to. At least, uh, like most of them. I don't like that being. a hindu guy because technically i'm the white male of this country so i don't have a right to speak on their behalf but through the show i keep trying to extract what's in people's hearts and there's definitely a lot of communal tension in our country and it seems to be increasing in my eyes this is political strategy to stay in power because most of the country is hindu jain which will uh, buddhist especially the influential parts which will keep voting for the bjp and it is going to be a pro modi government in power for a long time according to me when you actually go out on the streets uh when you talk to the average indian uh they love modi ji because i think his government has done a very good job of entering indians as hearts simple narratives you know the whole thing about how trump got elected he used very simple narratives and spoke to the common man hmm. it's sort of a version of that very simple campaigning like if you talk to anyone from the bjp it'll always be tied into oh modi ji is great Mm-hmm. It's a very simple statement. Uh, right. He's kind of like a god right now in the eyes of most common people, which is why I think the BJP is going to be in power for very long. My question to you is, as an Indian American, what's your view on Modi ji, uh, and uh, generally where India is going, both geopolitically as well as over the next hundred years, if the current government is in power. Or are you even concerned with Indian politics? Do you think that if this whole anti-Modi side gets elected, which is Congress and AAP right now, they're the two leaders? I think. Right. Ah, uh, would that change any of your decisions or any of your opinions about the future of this country? Great question. Um. So. Um. Well. Ah, uh, Prime Minister Modi follows me on Twitter, and I follow him. Um. So, and I'm generally in favor of. Um, economic development and, and so on and so forth. In many ways, the kind of right-left division within India is similar to that within the U.S. with a crucial difference, which is um, the U.S. had been thought of as a center-right country, like a Reagan country type country for many years, but now recently, in the early 2010s, um, and you could argue this has been building for a long time, but now it's flipped to become the farthest left country in the world. Mm. Okay, so at least the farthest left. Big influential country in the world. Um, you can still point to like North Korea and like Stalinist holdouts and so on and so forth, but like Europe, for example, is to America's right on a number of different issues. And then India and Israel and uh, the Eastern European countries are further to the right. And then you'd have China and Russia as the far right of the world in some sense, right? The nas- ultra nationalist, right? And India and Israel are somewhere in between. Um, Like China and Russia over here, and the U.S. and uh, you know over here. Okay, that's one. So basically, on a global stage, I think India is actually centrist. You have America, Bharat, China. Okay, because India is more liberal than China, and it's more uh, conservative or pragmatic than America. Right. That's a good place to be on a global stage. Right. And it's not usually how you think of it. Right. But but it's actually, you know, if you look at this G20 thing, for example, India was able to hash out. They're actually the pivot of the world. Right, India is a pivot of the world where America and China disagree on tons of stuff. Russia and America disagree on tons of stuff, but India was able to get a statement out about Ukraine that everybody signed on to. Right, so in a sense, it's actually valuable to have left and right wing within a country because everybody has somebody to cheer for. It's kind of funny to put it that way, right? But it's sort of like, um, for example, there's uh, you know my, my friends on the All In podcast, right? Um, do you know what that is? No. Okay, it's a popular tech podcast in the U.S. See, that's this is a good piece of cross pollination. <laughs> I didn't know if you're the last you know this. So, All In Podcast is a it's a tech podcast 
uh, I'm friends with all the hosts, uh, David Sachs, and you know, in, in particular. And basically, it's a bunch of tech guys, and some are on the left, and some are on the right, and some are libertarian, and some are unpredictable, you know. And anybody who's watching it has somebody to root for. Mm. Okay, there's always somebody who's saying something like, "Yeah, that guy, he's right. The other guy's a dummy." <laughs> you know what I mean? And it works because because of that. There's always some internal conflict, some some you know senses, but then there's still a common core, and it's almost like th this back and forth, you know, is a balancer. But there's a common core that keeps things moving forward. So long as you have that common core and that sense of centrism and purposes of civilization, things are good. And I kind of think I, I may be wrong about this, and that's why, like, I I, I um, I'm open to being persuaded otherwise. But my general feeling is that. In a weird way, India's internal conflict is actually an asset in a certain way relative to China's internal unification. China's degree of, because because disagreements lead to better conversations. No, actually, I don't think they do. I think it's actually worse internally, but it's better externally. The reason is the rest of the world doesn't have a rooting interest with some faction in China. China's internally unified. So the rest of the world has either side with China or bandwagon against China. There's always somebody to root for within India. So that means that it's there's like that um, there's a rooting interest there. Mm. So it does better in terms of global propaganda in a sense. Like the system, not you know, China's global propaganda or global receptivity is lower because people don't have somebody to root for within the country. Okay. In India, there's always one side that kind of is close to you. You're like, okay, that guy, right? Mm. And then you're rooting for them and you're kind of engaged with it and so on and so forth. And the question is whether the average of those two sides is still positive for the country. So basically, you're trading off some efficiency for some optics. Mm. Okay? Gotcha. And um, whether that's a conscious trade-off or not, it's a very natural trade-off where you end up often having two competitors, one of which is optimized for efficiency and has worse optics, the other one that has lower efficiency but better optics. Okay, with a higher tolerance for disagreement, so it's less efficient. Okay, when there's a one-party state, it's highly efficient for the growth of the country. Yeah, That's... well, the thing about it is, I mean, is it? It can. It could also be very bad, right? Because China had a one-party state in the '40s and in the '50s and the '60s and the '70s, <laughs> you know, like, and and to today, and it was terrible uh, under you know Maoism, and it was, uh, you know, it was a one-party state is a tool that can be used to drive a state into the ground like it did, you know, the Chinese people were impoverished for 30 years or build it into this, you know, military powerhouse, which it is now. It's also, by the way, it's actually used in America. You know why? California is a one-party democracy. Most blue states are now one-party democracies mm. where Republicans aren't really competitive. And Republicans are now doing that in reverse in places like Florida. They're trying to build their own one-party democracies. And the way you can really put a you know finger on this is you ask an American Democrat, They'll, you ask them, would you ever vote for a Republican? They'll say, never. Why? Because they're against democracy. Mm. So you think about the loop you get into. Oh, I'll never vote for the guy for the other party because he's against democracy. Therefore, I'm for a one-party democracy. And of course, that seems like a contradiction in terms of one-party democracy. But it's actually what it means is that the, the party out of power is used as like a customer satisfaction survey. <laughs> Okay. For example, when a CEO goes and gives a customer satisfaction survey, that's not like a binding vote that can throw them out of office, but the customers can be really dissatisfied and they take that and they try to make some edits to like reduce their dissatisfaction, right? So the feedback is, uh, is, is processed, but it doesn't result in a change of leadership. It may result in the CEO saying to X or Y executive, oh, you know, maybe you should do something else. And, you know, we have a different executive here because the feedback for the customer and on, 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 let's say the on, on the mobile app is so bad. We need a different mobile app leader, for example. OK, but um, but it's not like a binding board vote that like changes the CEO. OK, so that's how one party democracies use votes. They use them as like a feedback signal, customer satisfaction survey not as a binding, go ahead, referendum. Well, let's go back to India. Let's go back to India, okay. So with respect to India, um, what I want to say is that, because this is simplifying a lot of stuff, and I may edit this at some future time, okay? Yeah, yeah. But what I want to say is basically just that China and India are in their civilizational upswinging, and the West is in civilizational decline. And all of the words 
just kind of don't matter because the people will call something, the, they'll call it democracy in India, they'll call it democracy in America, but the democracy in India is ascending, and the democracy in America is declining. They'll call it industrial policy in America, and it results in graft and waste and so on. But in India, they've just started to make it work. Like they managed to get all the companies to use UPI and it's actually working. You know what I mean? Right? Go ahead. Do you see PM Modi as a massive catalyst in this ascending democracy? Because pro-Modi parts of India view him as the single savior. So I think, I think he's definitely done a lot. I think that the ascent of India arguably started in 1991. I, but I think it's also like just broader historical so we're talking about like the division between the sort of um historical forces versus great man theory of history do you know what i'm talking about no historical forces say uh this trend was happening the great man theory of history says the great man made the trend happen mm. right mm. and you can go back and forth on that and and you know uh for example with calculus um Newton invented calculus, but Leibniz invented it at the same time. So there were historical forces leading to calculus, but of course, Newton was also a great man. So you don't have to, they don't have to be mutually exclusive, right? Do I think Modi is probably the greatest prime minister India has had in modern times? I think that's probably true. I think Dalio thinks so as well. Um, he's just said Modi is like India's Deng Xiaoping. I think the infrastructure development and so on under him is being phenomenal. He's a, I think he's done a phenomenal job uh, from an economic standpoint, right? On some of the other stuff, like the communal stuff and so on and so forth, here's a vision that I have, which may be uh, uh, complementary or it's kind of cutting at you know right angles, right? Which is not uh, Indian nationalism. That's a domestic kind of message, which I understand why it's there, okay? But Indian internationalism, what does that mean? So that is something that appeals to Indians of both. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying this is incompatible with either a left or... It, I, both left and right could adopt this as part of their platform. It's just a different way of thinking about things, okay? What is Indian internationalism? It is, um, it's visas for Indians. It is thinking of the diaspora as something that you want to facilitate. Um, basically, both left and right want Indians to be able to travel anywhere, Indians to be able to get any job in the world, Indian companies to be able to compete with anybody, um, Indians as individuals to not be discriminated against abroad in hiring and employment and so on and so forth, right? That's a whole you know set of factors. I mean, one way of thinking about it is there's a lot of left-wing Indian Americans, for example, as well, right? And um, a fundamental difference between a left-wing Indian American and a libertarian Indian American is whether they think that the barrier to advancement is racism or the state? I didn't no? understand this part. You don't understand this part. No. Okay. So um, a left-wing Indian American will be focused on racial discrimination against Indians, for example. Okay. A libertarian Indian American will be focused on the state blocking their companies and taxing them and regulating them and interfering with them and so on and so forth. Right. Both of them generally don't want Indians to be held back. But what they think of as a primary barrier is different. So there's a sense certainly in which they disagree, right? Um, because the left winger often wants more state control to, to beat up the right winger. And the right winger um, wants less emphasis on all these accusations of discrimination so they can just kind of operate their business, right? Mm. So in that sense, they certainly disagree. But there's another sense in which they align because they're both clearing away obstacles for Indians to be successful. They removed the um, political, uh, you know, the, 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 any discrimination, and they removed the regulation. Do you see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which these people fight, but there's also a sense in which they sum into one component, okay? So the, those parts in which left and right of India, the left and right of India sum together, as you mentioned, lots of folks on the left in India, um, you know, look abroad, okay? So one should make it really easy for um, folks to move abroad, to do business abroad, all that type of stuff. And that's also something that all those other countries want. This is leaning into the diaspora, basically, right? When I said India is 10x Israel, leaning into the diaspora, making it really easy to be an international Indian. I mean, the OCI card is a good you know, version of this, right? You know what that is, right? Like PIO, OCI. Things like having... Um, 
you know, and I have to check on this, maybe this is already there, but like, uh, you know, a card that an Indian bank issues to you just work everywhere in the world, right? That kind of stuff, you know, the visa situation that I talked about before, um, various reciprocity for taxation agreements and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that the government can do that help the international Indian, right? And um, in general, my view is, remember I said like China plays the world's best home game, India plays the world's best away game, right? If if you just set up those, th that's infrastructure of its own kind, right? Just like there's roads for getting from place to place within India, you make really good roads for doing business in Seoul, really good roads for doing business in um, Riyadh, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you figure out what that, you know, you take a thousand people who have made that pilgrimage back and forth, and you survey them and you say, what were the top 10 headaches? And they'll say, oh God, it was such a pain to get a visa. Or they'll say, oh, I got there, but I didn't, um, there's nobody who spoke English. And so I had to figure everything out. In which case, maybe you have some Indian consulate official there who's got a little meetup spot for Indians, right? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You think of that as another set of roads that you're building. So you built the airports, it's a physical infrastructure. This is like the cloud infrastructure that, that facilitates that, okay? And, um, that is something which I think would be, uh, it's it's both obvious and it's non-obvious. It, I don't think it's being, an exp it's, it's a cross-cutting thing that lots of Indians like, that has nothing to do with internal Indian conflicts, that is leveling up both left, and of course, right of center Indians like that as well. Who doesn't want to be able to, you know, go and transact abroad, do business abroad? Left of center Indians are like, I want to get out of this country, mm. right? So this lets them do that as well, right? Mm. So it gives, it gives both of them something that they want. Go ahead. Would you be open to working with the Indian government? Uh, potentially, sure. I mean, but with that said, um, I'm going to work in, in an area that I think is, that mm. I make a contribution on. Maybe yeah. exactly this is the main player in the away game, which is Dr. Jayashankar right now. But oh, people well, like yourself have a massive role to play. Sure. I mean, I think in terms of, like Israel does a lot of stuff with its diaspora. Right. 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 So organizing diaspora, I think, is going to be very important. In that internet land that we... Boom. Yes. Damn. Right. So the internet Indian will be a very big part of the century. Can you like kind of draw out a practical version of that picture? Yeah. What does that mean? Right. Yeah. So first is, um, it's just Indians on the ground in every country that... Uh, basically, on every country in the world, maybe other than China will just become more and more influential. And here's here's how I think about that. Um, as I said, there's like 7 million Indians abroad now. And you look at their income and education stats and they're doing quite well, okay? Um, and they, they were basically completely non-existent in 1965. So in 50 years, the unlock has been really powerful. And the question is now we've got 1.4 billion Indians and on the order of a billion have gotten online and we're gonna get all of them online pretty soon, okay? And then the question is, what percentage of those can play at the same level at the 7 million abroad, okay? I actually think it's conservative to say 5%. 5% I think is, you know, like, because there's some degree of selective migration, right? It's doctors who made it abroad or engineers, okay? But even if it's only 5%, and I think that's conservative, okay? That's 70 million people. That's 10x what's already abroad. Mm -hmm. And what's abroad is already pretty impressive. If you had 10x the number of Indian Americans or Indian Westerners, that would be a massive labor shock in the world, comparable only to China, right? 70 million people at that ability level is a, is a new Germany. Germany's like 80 million people, right? That's a massive, massive, massive new thing on the world stage, okay? That's what's about to happen. And um, so what that means is lots and lots of, lots of I mean, Indian uh, media, India CEOs. One way of thinking about it is by 2040 or so, if you, if you look around your room, Almost everything is like made in China. That's the physical world, but an enormous part of the digital world will be will have the CEO be Indian. Okay, just the talent there that has gotten it's like a coiled spring that's about to kind of just go like this, right? And once you actually are put on a fair you know level playing field, you do it very well. Actually, when I when I said India is 10x Israel, it's actually a, it's a very deep analogy that goes very far back. One analogy to what is happening now is um, I call it Indian emancipation. And this is similar to actually something that happened in the 17, 1800s called Jewish emancipation, okay? So the Jewish community in Europe used to be totally, you know, um, 
they, they used to be religious, right? So they would wear, they, they'd have the long beards and uh, they'd wear traditional religious garments and so on. And they're very visually distinguishable. And over time, what would happen, what happened was uh, uh, Jewish people gained civil rights. But before then, what before Jewish emancipation, the Jewish communities within Europe were interacted with as like a community level, like, um, for example, the head of the community would go to the king and then they would pay taxes as a group, not any individual, right? They weren't citizens. They were like visitors, okay? It was almost like a corporation was there and it was there to do business. And then they paid taxes as a group, but any individual wasn't, okay? After emancipation, uh, Jewish people could um, like own property and participate directly and vote and marry, do these various kinds of things as individuals. And one way to think about it is rather than two like different networks where this, you know, would, would pay taxes a group to this, every node could connect every other node. Okay. So it became a fully integrated kind of thing. All right. So what is the analogy for us today with Indians? Well, for, for essentially many years, you had um, these various other countries that interact with India as a group, right? And then bit by bit, you had Indians emigrating and they started to get rights as citizens individually. They can interact individually with the rest of the world. And you had Sundar and Satya and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and now suddenly with the internet, all these Indians can connect to anybody else in the world peer to peer mm. directly, right? You don't have to go through a state. You don't have to do it as a group. You can, you can prove yourself as an individual, right? That is Indian emancipation. Very similar to Jewish emancipation where all of this talent that had been, because there's a number of very, very talented Jewish people that had, didn't have opportunity because they didn't have the full rights of citizens, right? And it's like all these Indians here that don't have visas, that couldn't make it abroad, that couldn't really participate in the global marketplace, they're sort of just geo-locked, domain-locked, are not anymore. Mm. Okay? So that is this enormous, enormous thing. There's more analogies like this, right? Another analogy, uh, you know, kind of important difference is China and more, more generally East Asian culture that the, um, they obviously have their own local tradition of, you know, writing that goes back thousands of years. It's very subtle and it's amazing in, in Chinese. Okay. But what they export to the world is visual. What I mean by that is, for example, so this is also the same for Japan and Korea. For example, Japan, what does it export to the world? Anime mm. and uh, video games, right? And Hello Kitty and stuff. It's all visual and cute, right? How about Korea? K-pop, right? That's exported to the world. What about China? It's like Hong Kong cinema and now TikTok. All of that is visual, right? It's fundamentally, it's video, it's aesthetics, right? That's, that's what it is. It's not verbal. You don't say... Oh, K-pop has amazing lyrics. It's not like the Iliad or the Odyssey where you're talking about it's poetry or whatever, right? It's just the aesthetics are what people like about it. Hong Kong cinema is not known for necessarily for its plots. I'm not saying it's terrible, but it's like the kickboxing and the <laughs> shooting and the, you know, the 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 the, the, um, the cinematography, right? Whereas by contrast, if if China and East Asia is is visual, India is verbal. India is verbal. Is verbal. For example, um, if you look for, at the recent Ukraine thing, right? China's foreign minister was on, uh, like Quinn Gang was like on CNN. It was completely unable to defend the Chinese position. This is this is their foreign minister, somebody who's supposed to be fluent in, in English and American culture. He's speaking in halting English. He can't make his case, you know, in, on, on a world stage. Whereas uh, somebody like, you know, obviously Minister Jayashankar, but uh, like um, any Indian anchor, like I saw Arnab Goswami is doing this. Indians argue in English. And so the moment that Americans were saying, oh, my God, you're so immoral for not supporting, you know, like U Ukraine by sanctioning Russia, Indians had 50 arguments ready to go. They're like, well, A, you didn't support India in the Bangladesh war, and B, you supported Pakistan, and C, you sanctioned India when we were getting nuclear weapons to, versus China, and D, uh, you know, you invaded Iraq, and E, um, you, you know, basically... Uh, had had Bin Laden on our border for a long time. We told you he was there and you didn't do anything, blah, blah, blah. Basically, Indians just went with like a zillion arguments back. And suddenly the Americans are totally taken aback because they're not used to somebody who can argue back in English. Palki Sharma, yeah. Palki Sharma is another one that looks like this. Exactly. She's very good at, she, she just, you know, takes nothing, you know, and she'll give it back, right? Dashum, dashum, you know? Uh, <laughs> see, I know that one, right? Yeah, go ahead. Go on. All right. Um, there's a part of me that's extremely narcissistic here. And I'm thinking that if you're saying it's verbal, uh, and I know in a past interview, I think you had with Tanmay, you said that media is going to be a huge export from yes. India. Yep. 
that means indian podcasting has a role to play on the global stage oh, as absolutely, well absolutely absolutely yeah. uh, which is my personal next challenge i'm trying to figure out how to reach out to the west sure. but uh, i think they only watch geopolitical and sometimes spiritual stuff uh, so i'm i'm just trying to figure out well, how i can expand in the west i mean basically you should do india one on one for americans do you think they'd watch it yeah i I'd, i'd tweet it like what would that contain the history you, you need an american on the show with you for that but basically like assume americans know nothing about india ah oh, okay like nothing truly nothing they don't know partition they don't know like sikhs and jains and you know all the different religions they don't know that bangladesh was part of pakistan right But what's in it for them even if i do this because uh now they do know that india is on our side versus china Okay. Okay. That's that's so basically <laughs> it's like Steph Curry knows Clay Thompson inside out. Ka, ka, yeah, yeah, it's it's well, you know, I had this thread which is actually I think an important thread for Indians to be aware of. Um and we can bring it up on screen or something like that, but it's like uh 1942 ally with Russia to beat Germany. 1972 the US allies with China to beat Russia. 2022 US allies with India to beat China. Mm. Okay, this is called offshore balancing. Basically, the number one allies with the number three against the number two until the number two is beaten, then rinse and repeat. <laughs> mm. Okay, and so what that means is uh, right now India is being showered with money and attention from the rest of the world in a way that it really hasn't been in a long time, right? And that's good that we have good leadership in place. Where Modi and Jay Shankar, I think, are smart enough to recognize that a that requires active balancing. Like they're very smart to keep a foot in BRICS and SCO, and host the G20 and so on and so forth, right? And the reason is that war is bad. You know, India is becoming Switzerland, the neutral kind of party. Let's hey guys, they're not the the far left of of the you know woke establishment in the USA, but they're also also not the ultra nationalist you know Han uh, you know basically Han Han supremacist you know right effectively in China. They're in the middle, right? They're the global mediator, right? And um, that means that they can get investment from potentially. Well, you know, do you get investment from China? Maybe not. But there's certainly a lot of Chinese construction. They have a lot of skills, right? You know, I know there's a TikTok ban and so on. But I feel India's policy towards China is more rational than America's policy towards China. America's policy towards China is, um, I mean, this is you know, the, the 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 guys who they thought of as just grinding away in the factory while they were watching Friends have suddenly become their own civilization. Right, like Americans thought of China as making plastic stuff at Walmart, and they'd always be like basically their their sweatshop or something like that, and suddenly they're like being really disobedient. That's a very unflattering way of putting it. Um, they they they'd said no, no, it's all about human rights and so on and so forth. That's why that's the only reason we're against China there because they're human rights. Come on, right? That's not <laughs> that's not it, right? Like the U.S. cared about human rights in the Middle East, blew up all these places. Now it doesn't talk about human rights in the Middle East. It never cared about human rights in the Middle East, in my mm. view. Okay, yeah. unfortunately. Um, which is also the worldview, by the way. Which is also the worldview. Like, That's right. Like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, dear Americans, I love you guys, and we've learned so much from you. But there are aspects of the worldview that will piss you off as patriotic Americans. Yeah, I mean, human rights is invoked selectively by America, and you know, to delegitimize its next target, right? And um, and it's something where when it's it's convenient, okay, you know, you'll do a deal like. Um, there's there's a bunch of countries around the world that'll do a deal with them, and they'll suspend the human rights. And they're like, okay, no pragmatism takes place. Well, pragmatism takes place sometimes. It's really taking place all the time, which is fine. I actually don't think a pol. I mean, even the term human rights steals a lot of bases, right? Because it's like, you know, blowing up the whole Middle East. Like, didn't they have the right to live? You know, like what what exactly does it mean? Human rights. It's it's just this it's this term that is optimized for people to sound good or whatever, right? Um, you'd rather have them be alive rather than have, in theory, you know. Um, I'm trying to give a good example of this, like Libya, Syria, Tunisia, Iraq, Afghanistan. All these countries that are blown to smithereens, pushed into chaos for some theoretical future benefit. I don't consider that a human rights policy, right? Um, I think it's um, you know it's human results. <laughs> Maybe that's that's a good way of putting it, right? <laughs> human results over human rights, like. 
is there a standard of living increasing? Is their life expectancy increasing? Do they are they at peace? Right? Human results versus human rights is just talk, and human results is reality. Right? Okay. Um, point is that when you look at the history of all these alliances, and I did a long thread on this, and there's so many more. Like the U.S. was allied with uh, Iraq um, against you know Iran, you know, or basically was playing both sides, and uh, then it was against Iraq. Or it was allied with Osama bin Laden against the Soviet Union. You know, do you know about that, right? Yeah. And then, of course, it was against. Uh, they shook Gaddafi's hand and then blew up Gaddafi. So, um, any should just be really cautious, right? And any deal it signs, it should take the money. It should deliver on its side, but it should very carefully negotiate what its side of affairs is. And at no point should it turn itself into Ukraine or even Japan. And in the sense of like Ukraine has just become a crumpled up war zone, right? Like, you know, versus Russia. That's what they're trying to turn Taiwan into as well. You do not want to be Ukraine. You don't even want to be Germany, where Germany has also had to like sort of suicide bomb itself, had to destroy its economy. It's deindustrialized. It's paid a massive price. It's like trillions of dollars in cost, 800 billion in just euro subsidies alone for energy and more than that, you know, probably when, when everything is taken into account for this Ukraine war. All of which, um, you know, you, you'll hear guys like Romney, you know, saying, oh, this is a great investment for us. Which is like, well, it's a great investment for Germany. <laughs> really? And I don't know. I'm not sure. But it was a great investment for the Ukrainians. I don't really know about that. Right. We'll see where, you know, if where that lands out. Talking about it in that way as a great investment, you'll have quite a few American politicians talking about that means is that human rights? That's a very instrumental view of use somebody else for your benefit. Right. And the U.S., has eased up on its anti-India rhetoric recently. So you notice, remember the thing, human rights is used to delegitimate those who they don't like. And then it's pushed back on when they're like, you know what, we need this guy for now. Mm. Using media? Yeah, using media. They're basically like using traditional news. Traditional news, you will literally probably go and see the number of negative articles on Modi has dropped off as, Damn. go and do the natural language processing on this, okay? You'll see the number of negative, negative articles has dropped off as the storyline has changed because they're like, okay, we need them against these guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the reason to know this is if you understand the game, you can win the game. Okay. Right? And Indians can do dashum dashum. Like lots of people don't want to think about politics at this level. They'll be like, what are you saying? There are sincerest allies ever, ever, right? No, that's just not the case. It's just not how the USA has been playing for a long time. I'm not saying there aren't sincere Americans. There's lots of good individual sincere Americans yeah. who will keep their word and so on and so forth. I think that's, you're talking about the geopolitical identity. I'm talking about Washington, D.C., yeah. right? Yeah, go ahead. Have you ever had a WWE watching phase? I mean, I know the, I know the show, yeah. yeah. Um, geopolitically speaking, America's like Triple H. Mostly mm. dangerous, but can sometimes be a friend. Well, yeah. So the friend, no. Ally, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right? And and there's a huge difference also between friend, ally, and enemy of enemy. You know, right. also, okay. this is true for every country. Like, there's no friends in geopolitics. Everyone's an ally to each other. Yes. Uh, China is trying to play around with India. Like, there's uh, two states that border with China. It's yeah, yeah. Pradesh and Ladakh. And, yeah, yeah, right. And they're trying to slice off territory. Yes. They're showcasing it on their own map and all that. Right. So it, even, even we're very aware that we need to ally with America because yes. the enemy is common. Yes, that's right. But there's there's a game to be played there, which is um, like India also recognizes there's areas of joint interest with China. Neither of them want to be nuked by the dollar. De-dollarization is actually an area where all the bricks, all because so we talked about the dollar before as like a money printer, where um, you know that's U.S.'s main export. It can print these dollars. It doesn't have to work for a living. It doesn't have to have any skills, which actually means over time it atrophies. But it seems it's short-term advantages. The printer is actually one analogy, but another analogy, an even more powerful analogy, is the dollar is a network. Okay, so think about Facebook, right? Facebook is a network, and Mark Zuckerberg is the administrator. And if he doesn't like you, um, he can deplatform you, right? Or have one of his execs go and do that, right? And that's no longer theoretical. I mean, I think they'd be doing it less in some ways, but it's not a theoretical risk. There's, there's certain speech boundaries you have to conform by. Okay. In the same way, the dollar is a payment network. And all the banks are like nodes in this network. And you're like a consumer. You're a, you're a node of a node. And the Federal Reserve under Jerome Powell can tell any bank, okay, you don't have a, don't have a license. You're not on the Fedwire network. 
or it can tell an individual your account is frozen. It's too much power. It's too much centralized power. Well, wait, it's more than this, right? Okay. So just like Zuck, you know, there's Facebook, but he also has Instagram and WhatsApp, which are like sister businesses. The Federal Reserve controls not just the dollar network, but the Canadian dollar network and the Bank of Japan. All of those other Western countries are like sister networks to the dollar, just like WhatsApp and Instagram are sister networks to Facebook itself. Okay, with me so far, yeah. right? Yeah. And these guys have administrator access and they can deplatform and sanction and seize and freeze um, on any of these dollar or dollar related networks. But they can't seize and freeze, the Fed cannot seize and freeze assets on China's digital yuan, in India's rupee network, on Bitcoin or on Ethereum. Okay, those are like four giant multi-hundred million or billion person payment networks that have different system administrators. With me? Okay. There's also smaller ones like, I don't know, Indonesia's currency or Brazil's that are national currencies that have their own system administrators. And the way to think about what is happening now, remember my thing about how you can analyze the world as the land, and that's important lens, but you also have to analyze it at the cloud and the network level. So this is what is happening at the network level is the dollar network is starting to have, not starting to have, it has massive scale competitors that are breaking away from it. That is what de-dollarization is. It's new networks arising and breaking away from dollar control such that not all of their assets of all of their citizens are underneath Jerome Powell's button, okay? So that is definitely an area where India, China, Russia, but also Saudi, Israel, um, Brazil, all these other countries don't want the West to have a remote kill switch for their economy because they can see that the West can just make up some story about the country, demonize them, hit a button, and you know they'll say, like, like Saddam had WMD. He didn't have WMD. Mm. It's completely fake, mm. right? It, it was like it was like a it was like an evil police officer who goes and plants drugs on somebody, and then you know kills them or whatever, right? That's what the U.S. did to Iraq, right? Yeah. It said that it, something was was bad there. There wasn't anything there. They, 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 they couldn't even plant the WMT or whatever, right? In this case, they're like incompetent police officer. And there's no penalty for that, mm. right? They blew up the entire country, killed all these people. And then they're supposed to just keep skating and we're supposed to say, oh, that's a guarantee of the world, you know, rules-based order. That's not how it works, right? Instead, what every country has learned is the US can literally manufacture a story, blow up your country, pay no penalty for it, and they, they will easily do the same with the dollar if you let them. Therefore, de-dollarization is national self-defense, right? So that's what I mean about like, um, it is, uh, you know, you could call this DC, right? Because again, I don't think the average American wants this kind of thing. In the same way, by the way, the average Chinese person isn't like a huge fan necessarily of what the Communist Party is doing, right? The um, Many Americans don't like what DC is doing, but they still empower DC to do these things, right? And so you have to sort of distinguish between the party and the and the, and the country yeah. and the people. Okay, so I also just want yeah, to go, go, put go an ahead. input, yeah. yeah, slightly metaphysical. Go ahead. I feel even countries have karma, mm -hmm. and though they didn't pay a price for doing whatever they did in Iraq or Afghanistan, we're talking about a descending economy. That's the price they're paying. It's one of these things. There's a time gap on it, right? Like basically. I mean, if you want a provocative statement for the Americans, BLM should have been about Iraq. <laughs> okay. And the reason is that that's not like ancient history. That's something that people did here and now. If you're going to rend your garments over something, mm. rend your garments over the crime that was committed just now. Right. Mm. And um, when I say Iraq, it's really a stand in for the entire Middle Eastern yeah. set of wars and bombings and so on so forth, which is just being forgotten as if it didn't even happen. It's like, change channel to the next thing, right? Um, which is so schizophrenic and bipolar, but all those countries are blown up and people's lives are ruined or whatever. Um, and and it's not it's not even discussed. And so the, uh, the karma thing that you mentioned is the soft power hit that's been taken, right? It just, uh, actually, you know what? You know who said this himself? Um, Bush actually had a, a malapropism where he was, you know, he was denouncing Putin. He's like, um, this you know, illegal invasion of Iraq, I mean, Ukraine. <laughs> okay, you can play that clip, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, it was just such a, you know, Glenn Greenwald's like, wow, the universe is speaking to us. Here. <laughs> you know? And so the thing is that 
you know, there, there, you have to have a single standard. You know, there's a saying like, um, it's a very old fashioned saying and it's un-PC in many ways, but it's sort of like Caesar's wife has to be above suspicion, right? Like she shouldn't just be chased, but she should be like, shouldn't have even a suspicion of, of that, right? And of course, that's, that's framed a very, you know, archaic way or whatever. But the point being that um, like, if the U.S. is supposed to say, oh, I'm, we're the guarantor of the world's, you know, rules-based order, it should be the most honest and fair dealing. Like, here's a small version of that, okay? Many years ago, Google was found to have, um, you know, Google Chrome, like the, the Google Chrome website, was found to be doing some stuff that Google search engine had published saying was bad practice. And this was found out publicly. So back then, because Google wanted to maintain its reputation for neutrality, they imposed a search penalty on Google Chrome itself. And you saw Google Chrome decline in market share very publicly, <laughs> or not decline in market share. They, like they harmed one of their own flagship products and the number of downloads plummeted for a while before the search recovered over time. Mm. And they did this to show that they were actually fair. They wanted to retain their reputation for impartiality and so on, and that the rules applied to them as well, right? Mm. Um, and that is a problem with how the, the you know, DC is acting is, I mean, it's basically over at this point, right? You know, it's, it's like beyond salvaging, but they're acting as if there is some rules-based order where the only rule is DC makes up the rules. Mm. Right. You can't say America first and, you know, we're going to sanction this and sanction that and freeze this and seize that and do that abroad and domestically to like the Canadian truckers. And yeah, I know Canada is not technically the USA, but it is um, it's like, you know, Instagram and WhatsApp are like the sister apps, you know, Canada and Bank of Japan are, are like sister apps to the, the Fed. Right. So you can't do all of that. And then pretend there's some neutral world, rules based order. What are the rules? Show me the rules. It's like the Constitution is it written down somewhere. No, it's not. Right. The rule is IMF, World Bank, UN. All of these are Western set up institutions, and and they get to make up the rules. That's why BRICS is arising. It's not. People think, oh, it's a NATO. No, BRICS is like a parallel UN. Mm. That's probably the best way of thinking about it. I've had some reps from the G20 summit. Oh, great. And they say that very openly. Oh, They say okay. that the UN hasn't lived up to what it was uh, built out to do. Yeah. And that's why we have G20 and BRICS now. Right. So one way of thinking about it is who are the five, you know, UN founding members, right? US, UK, France, Russia, China. In the, They're the winners of World War II. Yeah. That's what it was. Okay. But um, the winners of World War II, that's like 80 years ago almost, right? 78 years ago. And... Um, you know, in a sense, who are the founding members of BRICS? Well, Russia and China, that's still shared, right? But India, Brazil, South Africa, whether South Africa should be there, very, you know, that's like sort of a um, you know, questionable or whatever, but but fine, okay? Point is, certainly um, Russia, China, India are, you know, India should have been, certainly rather than France or whatever, you know, should be in the Security Council. Um, but it's really hard to reform something like the Security Council. Like you might be able to add to it, but very hard to subtract. France will veto its removal or something like that. It's like trying to reform Microsoft. You just had to build Google, right? So you're building a whole new set of international institutions in 2020 something from the ground up with most of the world economy here, actually, because BRICS is flip, you know, G20 or no, G20, G7. And most of the growth is here as well, right? Which is even more important because that's where the future is. And uh, you know, will it take the exact same form as IMF and World Bank? And so, I don't think so. Um, they're doing a lot more bilateral trades, like the uh, India UAE deal is in rupees, if you saw that, right? And they're de dollarizing. And so, anyway, my point is coming all the way back um, India's positioning, uh, I, you know, Israel is also like this, by the way. Israel understands that it's a small country and it has to kind of have. Play both sides, uh, hedge its bets, however you want to put it. Right? It didn't go extremely anti-Russia. It actually has a huge Russian uh, diaspora in Israel. Did you know that? Okay, a lot of Russians came to Israel after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay, and um, a lot of Russian Jews, but also Russians who maybe just call themselves Jewish. Okay, um, came to Israel after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and um, basically just became Israelis, and. Uh, 
so Israel has like Russians, a well, majorly spoken language. There is a lot of connections to Russia, cultural connections. They see Russia's side of it as well. So they have been quasi neutral in this whole thing, right? They have also not been forced to take a side. And uh, obviously there's other examples where India is similar to Israel. So India is like that in, in, in terms of sense of being in between. Um, India has a diaspora like Israel. There's the emancipation thing I talked about. There's the software thing, obviously both startup nation. There's the issues with terrorism where India and Israel both have those. Um, and then there's um, there's more pieces, uh, but but let me pause there because I, I wanted to get your, your thoughts. No, I, I don't want to interrupt your flow. If we talk about geopolitically, right? Like, you know, USA, China, India, I mean, that's a tripolar model, right? Where it's the, or more generally the West, the Abrahamic world, right? The, um, and the Abrahamic is not exactly just West because obviously there's Abrahamic religions out here as well, right? But let's call it, you know, there's the West, there's China, the Sinic world, and then there's the Dharmic, you know, or India world, right? Uh, the entire mental model of people is around a world where only the West matters, and to have these two civilizations rising to be at least a third of the world each is a total mind shift, uh, mindset shift for everybody. But it's actually going back to the future. Um, there's this great graph, uh, which um, if I could if I could show, you know, well, you know what's really unusual about this pod? Well, I'm not talking much. No, no, no. Well, that 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 <laughs> a little bit, but yeah. it's uh, I usually can show graph after graph after graph, right? Oh, okay. So. Um, but there's a graph I'll, I'll send you afterwards to put on screen sure. at this point, which shows that most of historical, uh, most GDP within historical times was was kind of centered around the middle of Asia, okay, until about 1820-ish or so. And then thanks to the Industrial Revolution, uh, it all rocketed out to Europe and the Mid-Atlantic, basically between the US and, and uh, Europe. And for about 100 years, um, between like 1900 and 2000, it was out there. But over the last 20 years, it's rocketed back to Asia even faster than it came. And so history is running in reverse. Okay. And so um, that's the thing we were talking about initially where, you know, the golden sparrow narrative and so on is like a numerical thing. It's a quantitative thing you can actually see. Right. So what that, um, one of the things that tells us is many things that are currently um, stuck in the in like the US, the America versions, we need to reinvent the internet versions and India will be a big part of that. Okay, so this is part of the kind of global strategy or whatever. For example, um, the America version is NASA, the internet version is SpaceX. Okay. Bam, like go on. Because SpaceX is better than NASA, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's true that SpaceX is still within the US, but it's not a DC organized project, right? The uh, America version is the U.S. Postal Service. The internet version is email or, or Gmail, okay? The America version is a dollar. The internet version is, uh, or let's say the America version is the U.S. Treasury. The internet version is Bitcoin, which you save in, right? America version is Wall Street. The internet version is Ethereum. The America version is taxi medallions and taxi regulation. Internet version is Uber, Lyft, Grab, DD, ride sharing, okay? Um, and so then what we want are, what are the alternatives to Hollywood, to Harvard, to the mainstream media? There's other pieces where we want the, the alternatives. So some of that already exists. The American version is Hollywood, and then you've got YouTube, right? The American version is Harvard, and you've got Coursera and Udacity. Um, the American version is mainstream media, and we've got Twitter, the internet version. But we're just actually at the beginning. We've got like the next iterations that are like the full internet versions, okay? And... Um, some of the big opportunities for India here, I mentioned robotics, that's a huge one, okay? So the American version was um, like physical manufacturing, like with muscle and so on. The internet version is robotics, right? Um, the American version of Hollywood is physical actors who are in person, big expensive sound stages and so on and so forth. The internet version is AI everything, mm. okay? It is... In, you know, if, if China was a tech and manufacturing superpower, India can become a tech and media superpower because U.S. media has just sort of abandoned its niche there. That's why, you know, like all of the, you know, Sports Illustrated or fashion magazines are all extremely woke. They all say the same thing. They don't actually, they're not really into sports anymore. They're about like just propagating the stupid cultural message. 
So there's a huge opportunity for Indian founders to come in and do media outlets that are actually sports or that are actually fashion, that are non-woke, that are actually focused on that vertical and do quite well, A. And there's also an opportunity to compete with Hollywood itself in terms of making feature films. Now, part of that is Bollywood, which is fine. But what I'm most interested in is like AI Hollywood, because that one person can maybe be a feature filmmaker in their bedroom, do the entire score, do everything as a full video and put it out there. Um, and you can do it for vertical, you can do it for horizontal, you can make it in every language. All that stuff is literally just typing faster. Now, practically speaking, technologically speaking, where are we in this whole, uh, hey, there's going to be a Black Mirror style uh, system that will create movies for you based on ah. text input? Well, so it's funny because um, it might be it might be something where you you may have seen this depicted on screen in a Black Mirror episode. Um, but I just think Black Mirror is funny because it's almost the opposite of what I, I would envision India's position in this being. The the West, its vision of the future is Black Mirror. India's vision of the future should be Bright Sun. <laughs> okay? What I mean by that is all the Western movies that are successful recently, it's like Top Gun, Barbie, Oppenheimer. It's about the 80s or the 50s. It's like memories of when they could nuke Japan and mm. we're really powerful and we're had it together as a society. So the past is in pastels and it's popular and the future is a black mirror. Mm. Okay. That should not be India's model. India, sh India should have a future that's a bright sun, more like the movie Super 30, right? Or <laughs> I'm surprised you know Super 30. Yeah. It's Go great, on. great, great. You know, that's a great movie because um, that's saying work hard, get good at technology, level yourself up, we can do it, right? A hundred movies like that, of course, obviously you don't can't just clone the exact same thing. That's the right kind of spirit. Okay. With that said, separating out the culture from the tech, I mean, there's a thousand people working on AI audio, AI video, AI uh, imagery, all the type of stuff. And it's going to essentially... Um, coincide with Hollywood having strikes and getting more and more expensive for these movies. And so the ARB there is so dramatic that the actual scarce resource for um, a movie will just be the quality of your screenplay. I mean, that's always been an important limiting factor to an extent that people don't get. Like a screenplay is surprisingly important for a movie to be good. If you have great aesthetics and a terrible plot, it really isn't that good. But now those aesthetics come from hitting keys. So that means India can become a media superpower. It can you can have one guy can be you know can generate a movie and it and it's in Tamil and Telugu and Hindi and Chinese and Korean and English and this and that distributed around the world in vertical video or horizontal format all just with export parameters. You hit enter and you've got fifty MP4s and you just upload them and you're done. Mm. Okay. Crucially, you can reshoot it with alternate endings. <laughs> right? You can change a different camera angle. All those are just parameters that you just have like a script and you hit enter and it gets compiled. Once this is, I mean, we're close to having this already, right? Once this is there, people wonder, how did we even make movies before? Wait a second. Oh my God. You shot them all manually and you couldn't edit them, <laughs> right? You couldn't just go in there and edit. And you think about that and you're like, a producer releases a film, they can't edit it. Now you can. Okay. So- of course, because it's all software generated, you can have it interact with, you could have buttons pop up on screen. You could have all kinds of amazing stuff once the entire thing, the studio is on your computer. Anyway, that's something that India should very much look at. That's strategically important because if you tell the story, then you have India at a minimum as a co-pilot. Okay, not a second class, not a, you know, the way Indians were cast, if they were cast at all, in American movies was as, you know, weird. Apu. Yeah, Apu, right, exactly. Or the the Temple of Doom, like, you know, this kind of stuff, right? Caricature, not really complimentary, negative. Um, but if you're the director, that doesn't mean, by the way, you have to be like, oh, Indians are the best. Yeah. There's, there's a place for that, you know, like RRR, that's in our movie. See, I do know a couple <laughs> of these, right? These are good, these are good movies. That's There's a place for, okay, Indian nationalism, that's fine. But actually, the what's interesting is, um, I said this at a tech conference and everybody laughed. I'm like, one of the reasons Indians can do really well on social media, you can type without an accent, mm. right? And you can type and you can generate AI without an accent as well. 
or you can generate AI in whatever accent. You can have it be an Irish an Irish accent for for the export to Ireland, right? When they download it from a server in Ireland, you give them the Irish version. So whatever your personal accent doesn't matter anymore online because you can hit a key and generate whatever you want, okay? This means that as a content producer, you can scale in a way that you haven't before. Anyway, that means that I think India becomes a media superpower as America is losing that role in many ways. Um, and technology allows the individual Indian to level up. Okay. Do you think there's room for a new social media platform that possibly arises out of India? Um, yeah. I mean, like there's always there's always room for so, I mean, something new like that. Um, AI first is pretty important um, because it just completely changes what you can do. You know, like it's it's like, a, you know, Instagram, when it first came out, the crucial thing was it was based on the mobile phone. So it had the camera and GPS, and you could assume that was there. Facebook didn't was built on desktop. It didn't have any notion of that built in. So uh, the fact that you had the camera and GPS meant that photo sharing tagged, you know, images was just trivial with Instagram, and it was just not. It was just a different action. It was more. Um, everything was just built around the phone as a fundamental assumption. If you build a new social network or or app or whatever it is, maybe it wouldn't be called a social network where um, you're, you're doing an action that is enabled by AI, the entire network could be different. It's a little bit like TikTok's algorithmic network. You know, It's just fundamentally different than the relationship-based networks uh, before you see content that you're interested in, regardless of who you're following. Right? The following is a secondary thing. It's the, um, it's a, the interest graph that's the primary thing. Right? So yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of AI first things that are enabled that weren't even possible before. Yeah. Okay. You know, in this whole conversation, I've avoided asking you any tech-oriented questions sure. because I feel that's a whole other podcast. Yes, yes. Which is why, even though I have so many more questions about media tech, I think we'll save it for a future conversation. Sure. Sounds good. And this one's more about geopolitics. Great. So um, we've spoken so much. Uh, and as an Indian podcaster, I think our country loves cinema. Yes. Uh, so my questions are slightly cinematic. And sometimes sure. cinema can be morbid which is why I might ask you a slightly more fine, question. Fine, yeah. um, we've had a lot of people come on the show, uh, Indian guys, Indian geopolitical commentators, who suggest that we're on the brink of a war with China. Mm. And so is America. Uh, I'd actually like to just have this as the last section of today's conversation. Sure, sure. Uh, have you thought about the possibility of a hot war? Or yeah. do you disagree? Or is it unpredictable? I thought, I've thought about it. For sure, I've thought about it. But... I'd say the this, this most important thing that India can do is to stay out of war. The most important thing that any country can do. I know. I know. But basically, India is actually rational enough that it might listen. <laughs> okay. America is in this weird mindset where after total tactical... I mean, you know who won the Iraq war? Arguably, Iran. More generally, BRICS. Okay, because it was a total tactical and strategic defeat. Eight trillion dollars was spent, like thousands of American soldiers dead, but also, you know, a million-ish people, uh, tens of millions dead and displaced if you include the whole number. And it was and but but if you think about it, the political outcome, what was the outcome? The outcome is um, now you have Iraq is trading in yuan. I don't know if you know that Saudi and Iran are at peace with each other, but China mediated it. Iran, UAE, uh, and Saudi all joined BRICS. Um, you you have Assad; he won the Syrian civil war, and relations have been normalized everywhere. Uh, you have um, like the Yemen war is over, and you know basically Sa Saudi's wound that down under Chinese influence. Basically, what happened was the U.S. retreated from the Middle East. Peace has come to the Middle East under a Chinese umbrella. Okay, that was the outcome. <laughs> all right. This was a colossal disaster for the USA. There's not a single win. You didn't get oil out of it. You just got a lot of money spent for absolutely no benefit whatsoever, right? Some old men might have gotten richer. Thanks okay, to. yes. But it was like, I mean, honestly, even then, at $8 trillion, you could have just given those guys a few billion dollars and then <laughs> said, shut up and, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, the mechanism of corruption is so ridiculously stupid that it would have been better if they had just been corrupt, right? Rather than... Oh, I have to make a thousand dollars on a bunch of missiles, mm. you know. So, um, I mean, eight trillion dollars is a lot of money. Okay, that's an incalculable. You know, you know what that is. That's like eight. Uh, actually, I don't know the current valuation, but um, let's call it four to eight apples. 
Mm. Okay. Like Apple was a trillion dollar thing. It was a $2 trillion company around the time of us. Four to eight Apple is a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, that's like an insane. That's, that's what we gave up for, for, for what, right? Just total negative loss. And then after this, after all of that, do you know the lesson that was learned after this colossal tactical and strategic defeat? Fight Russia and China next. <laughs> okay. That's really stupid. Basically, after like a total disaster where you said it was this huge human rights thing, oh my God, we need to save Muslim women and so on and so forth, all the stuff that the US professed to care about, right? In the 2000s. I remember this. It was just like war, const- on, terror. war on terror. After hearing about this constantly for 15, 16 years, it's a non event that it like, it's not even discussed. There's no aftermath. There's no like reassessment. There's no retro. It's just on to the next disaster. Six months after the retreat from Afghanistan, gigantic war with Russia, you know, on, on the Ukraine thing, where some of the escalation with Russia actually started after the Afghanistan uh, thing. You can go back and look at some of the back and forth. And of course, Russia is also at fault for the invasion and, and whatnot. I'm not saying they're not, but I am saying that the spending in Ukraine also is at an even faster clip than the entire Middle Eastern thing. You know, you're talking a hundred billion in direct, but it's like trillions indirect um, from the US and, and EU. And they're already out of ammo, like a year and a half in or what have you. And so it's just like this another lining up for another colossal disaster where they're talking about a surrender, you know, or, or some treaty with Russia. Blinken is himself is talking about this. So we're open to negotiating. Again, what was gained by this when everybody was like, why don't you just negotiate at the beginning? If you're going to give up some territory, just negotiate and who cares, right? And then, you know what? Oh, let's go to China next. Come on. It's like a drunk smashing his way through uh, like obstacle after obstacle, still on adrenaline, not realizing how much damage he's taking. You can only have so many trilli- multi-trillion dollar total catastrophes before you start to realize, oh, I, I lost a limb in that door back there. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so what's happening is U.S. state capacity is going through the ground. Even as ambitions are going through the roof. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like not even able to like keep the, you know, it's not even able to build a bus stop, but I think it's going to stop China. Mm. You know, you have to like take care of yourself first at home and fix your stuff, stuff at home before, not, not that you should go out, you know, like I think it was Washington or somebody who talked about, you should not go abroad in search of monsters to slay, right? (laughs) Take care of itself first. The good thing is there is on both the left and the right, uh, you know, a, a, um, People will call it an isolationist tendency, but it's like pull the U.S. back. It's possible that that happens uh, and or a financial crash happens before there's a fight with China that then just kind of changes things. Okay, But the thing is that the reason the U.S. is pursuing military confrontation with China, in my view, is it's actually almost the opposite of the U.S. versus USSR in um, the Cold War, because then the U.S. was able to internally build and it fended off the Soviets abroad, and the Soviets had a dysfunctional society, but they were a military and propaganda power abroad. And now it's the reverse. It's This time it's the communists that are actually capable of internally building. They've got all the factories and so on. And it is the, quote, capitalists that are the military and propaganda power, but they have a crumbling society in many ways, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so it's like a flip. This way, I mean, the history is running in reverse. It's like a mirror image of, of the 20th century. And um, China's like internal model, from what I've seen, and people will disagree with this, but it's basically they've seen what's happened in Ukraine. They don't want another thing like that. Uh, their big goal is to prevent some kind of declaration of independence in Taiwan that would maybe force their hand or whatever. Short of that, they don't want to do a fight. Instead, they think that they can just outlast the U.S. and it'll eventually collapse under its own you know things. It's the inverse of the Cold War, where there's too many contradictions in the U.S. In fact, Putin's invasion um, was really stupid because he should have just held off and there would have been so much fighting within the West that it you know, wouldn't have done it. He gave them a reason to unify or whatever, so he shouldn't have done that. Um, I mean, for all kinds of other reasons, it was, a, it was more than anything else. It was a mistake, right? He mm. was just like stupid and achieved the right objective. Now, with respect to India, India has, uh, you know, um, obviously security concerns on its border with Pakistan, but it's pulled away economically to such an extent from Pakistan that that's less less of an issue than it was, right? A, B is Pakistan has had this coup from the U.S. If you saw that reported, right? Like 
it was rumored, but now the Intercept has actually got a lot of documents showing that the U.S. just executed a coup in Pakistan because it didn't vote with them on Russia, right? And again, is it oh the world's largest democracy or whatever? Come on, this is all basically vote with us, and if you don't vote with us, we will impose penalties, including deposing your leadership. We will we will depose your leadership so that you support our democracy. <laughs> you know what I mean? We will mm -hmm. dictate terms. So you, okay, so India fortunately was able to not just stand up to the U.S but avoid whatever CIA, black ops type stuff they ran in Pakistan, which is a less well-organized society. So remember that, you know, there's there's the game that you're seeing in public, which is, you know, this diplomat says this, this diplomat says that. And they're like, why isn't India? India was under immense pressure to kind of buckle and conform. And it resisted and didn't just resist. It resisted successfully enough. There is like, okay, you're too strong. We have to deal with you. We can't just dictate to you. This is also the attitude you should take with respect to the war stuff. Like basically, I'm of the opinion, look, I don't know every single detail of this border conflict. I've, I've seen you know a bunch of, I know that they fight with sticks so that they, there isn't like a um, too much of an escalation. That's smart actually. Both Indian and China are actually pretty smart for following that protocol because it limits the degree to which things can get out of hand between these two nuclear powers, right? With that said, I saw good signals that India and China were cooling this down, you know, on the border thing. I know there's this map thing, and the map thing went really viral on Twitter. But sometimes, I, it's not to my knowledge. It's not like Xi tweeted it or whatever. He po uh, to my knowledge, it's not like he had like a senior official post it and be like, "This is ours," you know. Mm. It could just be something that went viral and is being, you know, perceived in the wrong way. Um, not to say that I think of the Chinese. In, I'm not like. You know, uh, uh, remember I think Nero said like Hindi Chini bye bye or something like that, right? <laughs> That's like naive, okay? So I'm not saying that, but I am saying that in general, I don't think China wants conflict with India. I think they uh, basically want India in bricks, and they want India on side to de-dollarize, and they want to court India. Even if India, it's a little bit like um, in the 20th century where India leaned towards. Um, the Soviet Union, and you know, it was it was left, but it wasn't communist, right? Uh, this is like the reverse, where it will lean towards the the West and be capitalist, but it's but it's not like all the way there. And in fact, it's um, it's smarter about it. It may be the most functional democracy. Um, in many ways, actually, you know, in some sense. All right, all right, here's one. Okay, this will this will definitely here's a provocative statement, right? In many ways, after this G20 thing, you can make a case that, that Modi is actually the leader of the free world. Ooh. Okay, why is that? Because <laughs> he was able to get everybody together for an agreement on Ukraine that nobody else was able to do, A, right? B, that that happened in India, right? C, he also has a diplomatic channel to China and to Russia who will listen to him. America will listen to him. China and Russia will listen to him, right? Pretty important. Moreover, India, like Modi is more popular than Biden. He's more democratically legitimate if you talk about raw votes. He has more people of color and poor people voting for him <laughs> than Biden does, right? Just in raw numbers, all of these kinds of things. These, the, you know, you say this kind of thing and people are like, oh, no, that can't be right. <laughs> and the thing about it is, is because they define democracy as ruled by American Democrats. It's not the same thing. You know, it's like, it's like a, during the Cold War, the Soviets defined communism as ruled by the Soviet Union. And what was Mao doing? Well, that wasn't real communism. That was a different communism. No, they're bad guys, right? Okay. Of course, they were also bad guys, but in a different way. In the same way with democracy, there's like, just to digress on that for a second, there's like four different kinds of democracy. There's blue democracy, which is American Democrats rule. Red democracy, which is American Republicans rule, like in Florida and Texas. Um, they'll call it being a republic as opposed to being a democracy. There's tech democracy, which is like cryptograph uh, cryptographically verifiable on-chain voting. It's like... Uh, for example, something called snapshot.org on Ethereum, where you're, you're voting on the blockchain, not just transacting. And there's Indian democracy. And in many ways, I actually think um, just like you know, Chinese communism was a second rate version of communism, and then the Soviet Union fell, and now Chinese communism is like the number one brand of communism, I kind of think Indian democracy is like being the second most known version of democracy. But if there is a second financial crisis, which I think is coming, and U.S. democracy takes a huge hit and is in internal conflict over lots of lost money and so on and so forth, I do think 
Indian democracy has a chance to become the world's leading brand of democracy in the same way that China becomes the world's leading, leading brand of communism. Do you see what I'm saying? Right? Yeah, like yeah. democracy with the, uh, you know, ch communism with Chinese characteristics, the democracy with dharmic developments or something Ooh. like that. <laughs> okay. A lot of Indic scholars will actually say that, hey, you know what? Democracy originated here because we're the world's oldest civilization. Well, yeah. So we're going back to like ancient history. Well, so in, in a sense, what China did was they took the name communism and then they changed it from this like insane Western ideology that they imported into something that essentially resembles like the Mandarin system yeah. of old. Right? Chinese emperor philosophy. Ch exactly. So they have like this, the Gaokao and the exams and, you know, the, the way, do you know how the Chinese political system works? I mean, all I know is it's a one-party state. Yeah, but right now. but why does it work? Because there's lots of one-party. Okay, so this actually this is guy Eric X Lee who gave a talk on this ten years ago, and some of it's outdated, but it's probably the best talk I've seen on this for an English language audience. It might be a more up-to-date one. But basically, the way it works is this: you you know you can't do something in China like um, you can't have something like Obama or, or Trump where he went from community organizer or no government experience to like running the entire government. That can't happen in China. And so what happens is. If you are interested in being part of the government, A, you join the party, which is itself competitive. There's like, um, you have to do exams and stuff. I think it's like about 6% of Chinese are members of the party, okay? So it's like 100 million people, but it's only 6%, okay. B, you, uh, you, know, you, you fill out whatever Marxist theory stuff you have to do within the party. You attend the meetings and all this kind of, you also have to maintain, it's like running for office. You have to uh, make sure that you're not gambling and drinking. You know, you have to like maintain a reputation for character or whatever, and people will review that. Then perhaps you are appointed as mayor of like some hundred person village or something like that. Okay. Then if you do really well on that on the numbers and you show economic growth and development, then you can run a thousand person town and then a 10,000 person city and then a hundred thousand person and then a million person province and so on and so forth. Okay. And it's kind of like a giant corporation where they start you off as dog catcher, you know, and then you level all the way up. And if you look at Xi's history, that's exactly what he did. He ran larger and larger and larger parts of China until he got to the central committee and he's running the whole thing, right? Now, that's not to say he's good. Again, I always have to say this. That's just to understand how they operate, they operate as a giant corporation where you can't just go and run a billion person country until you run a hundred million person thing or a 10 million person thing. And you deliver enough numbers. Now, those numbers could be faked. There's patronage involved as well. Like, okay, you know, on the margins, this guy only delivered 90% growth and this guy, or 9%, 9%, ah, 9 percentage points growth and this guy delivered 15, but I like this guy more so he gets promoted. It's like a corporation where the numbers matter, but so do the relationships, okay? Still, that's kind of how it runs, right? And um, that is, that's different from how India operates. That's different from how the US operates. Um, Why did I get on that? I, there's a reason I got on that. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, oh, the one party thing, mm. right? So the main thing is though, that the way that China is set up now, it's not like Soviet communism. It's not like Maoism. It's not all chaos. It's very hierarchical and organized, right? What they did is they used this leftist thing of communism to justify rightist hierarchy. <laughs> okay. They have the label on it. And this is actually very common in history. Mm. Okay. For example, Christianity was originally the religion that tore down the Roman Empire, but then it set up the Holy Roman Empire and, you know, was justification for hierarchy and for like the Christian kings and so on, right, of the Middle Ages. And, um, you know, if you, you can look at this over and over again, for example, the Republicans were the revolutionary left party in 1861, ending slavery and so on in the USA. Okay. They were called the radical Republicans. And then they became actually the right, the conservatives, because basically what happens is the left-wing party, if it's successful, has a bunch of slogans. It's like a religious movement. It wins power and it has moral authority. Moral authority leads to economic authority. Economic authority means they become the rich, they become the right. And then there's an attack by a new left that arises. Okay. That's like this cycle. I talk about this in the Network State book. But um, point is that just like China kind of has rebuilt its ancient civilization with the name of communism, India is rebuilding its ancient civilization with the name of democracy. And there's obviously a lot of democratic aspects that are still preserved, right? Um, in the sense of like, there's more popularity for Modi than there is for Biden, like, like the voting and elections, all that stuff is happening. Um, but it doesn't have the irrational parts of 
where U.S. democracy has gotten to, right? It's actually good because in the event that the U.S. really face plants in this upcoming financial crisis, and I'll, we can talk about that, Dalio, lots of people are seeing something huge on the horizon, okay? Um, really, we're in the middle of it in some ways, but, but, but actually recognize as such. If and when that happens and Western democracy takes a huge hit, we'll be very lucky that Indian democracy is around because otherwise everyone will just run the Chinese stack. Because China is a China basically has a turnkey stack. Any country, it's Africa, it's South America. You turn this key, and Chinese engineers will come. They'll build your roads, build your bridges. They'll install WeChat. They'll install Alipay. Your country will actually be. Um, they'll have roads, and everything will work. But the private keys are in China, mm. and that's the thing. You know, the V1 American is like. Oh, the Chinese are an ideological power. They're trying to export communism all over the world, et cetera. The V2 is to roll your eyes at that and say, actually, no, look, the Chinese are just there to do business. They're just there to export. They're really not ideological anymore. They're not Maoists anymore in the same way. Yeah, Xi is a nationalist, but they don't, they don't think that their model can be exported. But the V3 is to say, that's true. However, when they go and put the Chinese model into a country, they're going to put the software stack there as well, which is WeChat and Alipay and all that stuff. And that has embedded within it ideological assumptions, and it has the server and the root control back in China. So it's software that is the intersection between the economic and the ideological, right? Okay. And so that V3 is basically, um, this is actually where India should be positioning, where it should have an alternative civilizational stack that it can export. Other is actually kind of part of that. It's actually being, you know, pieces of that are being used by like Southeast Asia, like, you know, India stack in general is something that a lot of countries are looking at. If you can make it work for India, you can make it work anywhere. And because of the scale and complexity and so on of it. What is the India stack in your eyes? What is India stack in my eyes? It's UPI, it's other, it's it's a set of technologies that um, have been developed for payments and identity and now DEPA with data and, and so on and so forth. Technologically super advanced, yes. which will then protect you from possible wars on your country because this conversation began in... In wars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, basically, India exporting parts of its culture. I mean, Buddhism... I mean, the thing about China is, remember we are talking about how China plays a great home game, right? China's also historically... I mean, it's... Or currently right now, it's an amazing physical goods exporter, net. But it's also actually a culture importer. Buddhism is imported... Communism is imported, and um, a fair amount of the tech, you know, ideology was imported. Right? They're amazing at taking that and customizing that, and so on and so forth. And they have their own rich culture, or what have you. But they're like, I would argue, a net culture importer. We don't usually think of that as another set of the books. India, arguably, is the opposite. Yeah. Um, or at least is compet more competitive in the sense of, you know, yoga and meditation and stuff like that have been exported. Um, but it's. I think we're just the beginning of truly exporting quote Indian culture, and when I say by the way India becomes a media superpower. Earlier, and then we come back to the war thing. A lot of people immediately think that means Indian accent guys in Bollywood are going to become really popular worldwide. That's not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is when when you sit on a chair like this, we don't think of this as a Chinese chair. It's a global chair that probably happened to have been made in China, mm. right? So India becomes a media superpower means people are consuming media content that is globally competitive and just happens to be made in India, maybe by Indian people with Indian accents. It could be a video game, for example. It could be virtual reality. It could be AI created content, but it is globally competitive. And then you look in the fine print and it's like, oh, happened to be made by an Indian, right? Or it's made by somebody who's pseudonymous. A lot of Indians are actually pseudonymous on social media because um, they speak English fluently, or they type English without an accent, and this way nobody can be like, "Oh, I don't know this random guy" or whatever. They they don't they aren't discriminated against on, on the basis of follows, right? Okay, coming back to the war thing. Um, the reason that the U.S. is poking a fight with China on the military thing, and I do think it is the U.S. poking a fight rather than vice versa, because the U.S. poked a fight with all kinds of Middle Eastern. I mean, who's in common among all these wars, <laughs> right? You know, uh, that's not to say that that. China's neighbors love China. They don't often. They they were kind of concerned about it or what have you. But um, basically, um, the the U.S. You know, if you've got a hammer, everything is a nail, right? 
and they're like, okay, we've got a military. That's the one thing we have. Let's do a fight. I don't think they, you know, uh, I don't, first, I don't think they understand the, the extent to which the U.S. military still depend on Chinese supply chains. And second, I don't think they understand the degree of financial overstretch of the U.S. right now. And it's quite possible that this second Cold War just collapses if the U.S. economy collapses before or hits like uh, serious inflation before this, this physical conflict, okay? But it's also possible that this is actually how the U.S. empire ends. They start a fight with China and they lose. Why would they lose? Because like China cares about Taiwan. America truly does not care about Taiwan. 2011, there was an article that came out in the New York Times and it said, uh, to save America, ditch Taiwan. They said, basically sell Taiwan to China for a trillion dollars of debt forgiveness and let them go. Okay. Most, I mean, four years ago, most Americans couldn't find Taiwan. Today, most Americans can't find Taiwan on a map. No, Americans don't. It's like they, they care about Taiwan in the same way they care about Ukraine, in the same way they care about the rights of Afghanistan women, mm. which is they don't really. Okay. They truly, let's be super honest about it. They don't care. They're just using that as a way to, you know, it's a little bit like, I'm not saying that there weren't like real emotions at one time about, let's say, the plight of Afghanistan's women or, you know, like, you know, people, because this, these are justifications that are used after 9-11 for all the wars and stuff like that, if you remember that, okay? So I'm not saying that that uh, these didn't pluck at heartstrings. Oh, we need to liberate those women. That's why we're going and blowing up the whole place. What happens is it's a little bit like a, think about an actor, okay? Like a really good method actor, they are able to um, like convey an emotion to such an extent that you believe that they actually feel that. And in fact, they do feel that because you can't really fake that at the moment. They truly, truly do stand with Ukraine. They feel it at that moment and then <laughs> cut mm. and it's over. And the country is blown to smithereens and the attention is on the next thing. Right, that's that's the American like bipolar kind of mindset where they care, care, care. They really care. They're convinced themselves they care. Oh my God, this is the most important thing in the world. How dare you not, India? Blah, 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 blah. And then if you can just ride that out, because it's very <laughs> short term, you just ride that out for a few weeks or a few months. Say you can use the delaying tactics, right? You say, okay, let's uh, let's talk about this. I'm going to put it on my calendar for 30 days from now. Just got to get some of the people together, right? Delay, and then their bipolar frenzy just kind of <laughs> goes away, right? They have no staying power whatsoever. Because the mental health issues take over. It's a, it's basically, it's not just, you know, people talk about multipolar world. It's a bipolar America. Mm. Not just in the sense of like red and blue, but literally in the sense of bipolar where if you go and look at the last 10 years, you'll go to Google Trends and you put in like Me Too, right? BLM. Ukraine, okay? Um, all of these things are just like these gigantic spikes where they're the most important thing in the world and everything is talking about them and lives are being destroyed and it's like this cyclone and then just whew, gone, <laughs> gone mm. right? And so that means that like the top speed of or the, 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 the peak of like US intensity is actually still very high. And when you're in that moment, it really does feel like it's the most important thing in the world, okay? Mm. Um, and that it will always be, and then you change your whole life for it, and so on and so forth. And then it's gone. Okay. Okay. So staying power, anything like anything that the America is truly serious about, uh, well, there's very little it's very serious about, actually, honestly. Okay. But um, you put into a contract. Okay. If you can't get that, you can never yield to hysterical America when it's like screeching at the top of its voice in the middle of one of its manic kind of things, when it's like manic about Ukraine or manic about BLM. BLM was so important in 2020 to the point they're burning down their own cities, right? And conveying that. Does anybody talk about it now? Mm. Did anybody talk about it a year later? No, it's like ignored. Oh yeah, don't talk about that, right? Mm. Okay. So um, this would be the danger for China. For war with China, right? Like basically, the you know, for example, remember the Pelosi thing last year? She there's a uh, she made a trip to Taiwan to you know, and it was like a surge of a lot of negative energy and attention, and it's like trying to force you into a decision of 
like, okay, will China do something or will it be humiliated and it'll lose power? And so, and you know what the answer was? Ignore. <laughs> that was actually the answer was ignore this latest hysterical thing because they can't even remember what the Twitter drama was last week, let alone last year. And it actually, it actually doesn't matter, right? Once you can just kind of ignore American hysteria and you just ask, okay, how much money are you going to pay? Right. I know this is very cynical, right? But it's also something where like the Indian audience should just tune out any any American who talks about human rights, any of them who talk about like all that type of stuff. Obviously, they don't, you know, they're they're just gonna skip over to something else. They'll apply the human rights very selectively, as I mentioned, right? They applied it to the countries they're enemies with, and they subtract it and they stop writing about it on the countries they're friends with. And you can see it in the articles, as I mentioned, right? Less criticism of Modi because they need India. More when they thought they could bully it. Okay. Similarly with China, by the way. There's less criticism of China when they were just a sweatshop, and more when they're actually, you know, confrontational. Okay. Again, this is at DC's level. I'm not talking about the individual Americans, the tech Americans, those are great people, okay? But the, um, so the danger is that there's some kind of hysterical stand with Ukraine-like thing that comes that India will feel pulled into making some rash decision. And the answer is delay, 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 delay. Do not be pulled into a rash decision because America will pull, like for example, Everybody in Europe has gotten pulled into this disaster in Ukraine, and the U.S. is on the other side of the world, mm. and can cut and run whenever it wants, <laughs> and it probably will in this next election. Okay? Now, you're already seeing most of the Republicans are against aid to Ukraine. Democrats are seeing it's not polling well. Why are you sending billions to Ukraine and only $700 to Maui? You know, like that's not polling well for obvious reasons, right? You know, like even New York, like... Uh, New York City, the mayor is saying, why are we sending money to Ukraine when there's, I don't know if he said that, but people are saying that to the mayor. Why is money being sent to Ukraine when there's all these legal aliens, et cetera? This is definitely becoming a thing, right? So what will happen is the US talks and or funds Ukraine into blowing itself up for this war and uh, and Europe into crushing itself. And then suddenly it's like, oh, it's on to war with China now and leaves them to pick up the mess with an angered Russia and a blown up Ukraine and a deindustrialized Germany and so on. Just like the same chaos that was exported to the Middle East, okay? India at all costs must avoid this form of American influence, right? The manic bipolar, get you into a giant fight, have your society blow itself up, while then it goes, when it decides to, it goes back and retreats to its own, mm. you know, oceans, okay? Because it has that luxury, right? It is not adjacent to Ukraine. It's not adjacent to China. And it's not adjacent to Taiwan. Um, and it can just totally change its mind when it's convenient for it. And uh, and then say, oh, maybe parties change, you know, times change and cut and run and leave you holding the bag, okay? So delays on anything you know, radical, cost sharing, very important, right? How much money is America going to pay for it? Okay, cash now, right? For for whatever it is. And they do have cash, they're still printing, you know, and we're in like, unfortunately, people say it's like the looting the treasury moment of empire, right? Basically, the US has more debts than it can pay. 33 trillion is an ostensible number. It's really more like 200 trillion. That's what Drucken Miller said. But right now it's like this weird thing where it's like, bursting the host and the money is flooding out in different ways. And then it's all going to be very scarce. It's already becoming scarce. It's weird. It's abundant and scarce at the same time. People are posting TikTok videos where they say, I'm making $80,000 a year and it's more than I've ever made before, but I'm also struggling to survive because $80,000 isn't worth what it is anymore. So it's this weird stage where there's still perhaps some degree of checks being written by the US. But you should just basically assume that like long-term contracts won't be honored, that there'll be some massive financial crisis in, a, in maybe a year or a month, few months, a few years. Dahlia thinks it's 18 months. Uh, like that, that was like six months ago. So it's like coming soon. Um, Morgan Stanley thinks it's going to be worse in 2008. Fitch is about to downgrade 70 banks, including JPMC. So whether the US will even have the money to cut these checks is very much TBD, okay? So basically, I, what, the way it summarizes as do not, fall for hysterical American wars. Um, do not listen to them on human rights. They have no moral authority. They know they have no moral authority. That's the thing. The smart Americans, there's a bunch of smart Americans who are 
I'd say it's on there 60% of the country now who are completely tired of what DC is doing around the world, right? They are, um, you know, it's like Republicans who are going and often dying as troops and stuff overseas, right? And they they particularly don't like this. But there's also a lot of Democrats who are like, look, we can't go and lecture about human rights without actually talking the talk and we just blow up all these countries. There's still that faction of like Glenn Greenwald type Democrats, right? So, so there's a lot of change in the air happening. And we're still at the state where um, DC thinks it can go and still fight all these wars and spend all this money and do everything at the same time. But but India should not get caught up on that. You know, in some ways, India's biggest advantage? It's not arrogant. It's friendly. Well, not just that. It doesn't think it's number one. It doesn't mm. think it's completely invincible. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't hold itself out as... We are the champion of, you know, by the way, the whole human rights thing is um, is just a way to declare yourself. It's just supremacy. Mm. It's just, right? It's, you know, people turn to white supremacy. It's West supremacy, mm. right? The West is the best. You're the worst. We determine what human rights is. Some stupid European, like, you know, think tank says, oh, India isn't democratic and is meant to lecture you. And it's the same as like Christian missionaries coming in, lecturing you and talking down to you and saying, do this, do that, do this, don't do that. You're a, you're a sinner, you're a heathen, listen to us for your own good, right? Mm. And so you just totally reject all of that, completely reject all of that because that is a way for them to export a quasi-religion um, where if you, if you listen to it, suddenly you're dependent upon their human rights rankings and stuff like that, right? right. If instead you put it as um, like the Pope's rankings, you'd see through it immediately, Okay, right? But Harvard's rankings are like the Pope's rankings. <sighs> okay, then. Uh, this is what the entire conversation was leading up to because my cinematic culture, which is also technically your cinematic culture, sure. uh, looks at geopolitics in the world currently culminating into this war. And I've always had people on who say, a war is definitely going to happen or it's definitely not going to happen. And what I've enjoyed about this conversation with you, and it's a big reason I've not interrupted, is that you do live thought experiments. Like mm. I can tell that you're thinking about it as you're speaking. Right. When most people who are on the show, and I don't think it's a better or worse way, but they come on screen with their preconceived thoughts. Right. So I enjoyed not interrupting you, Balaji Srinivasan. Okay, well, hopefully that, hopefully that could be helpful. Yeah. Um, on the war topic, I I don't think the future is, is set. I think it can still be set by our choices, you know? And I think India should absolutely stay out of war to the maximum extent it possibly can. Um, and... Fortunately, I think the government right now is smart enough about that. And um, the, the, it's just, the thing is, you know why the U.S. was so dominant in the 20th century? Everybody else fought. And the U.S. was basically an ocean away. Mm. And um, it was the least devastated by World War I and World War II of any of the big powers. Right? By the end of World War II... Japan had been nuked and China had been actually invaded and smashed and it had a, it's all a Chinese civil war after that. Um, obviously, uh, Europe, Western Europe was just blown to smithereens. Um, the UK, it's, it couldn't afford its empire anymore. The Soviet Union had, everybody else had taken massive, massive hits, except the USA, which only lost a few hundred thousand men, right? And so... Yeah, it took a hit, and World War II, you know, was still a significant cost to the U.S. It, the Pacific War, in particular, but it was okay overall, right? And it was net stronger. And actually, that's why people romanticize 1950s America, like, oh, when one guy could work, and you know, he could bring home the bacon for a family of this and that. Well, the rest of the world was totally bombed out, mm. so his relative competitive advantage was so high they didn't need any skills. And the guy who was like an Indian, uh, you know, physicist or a Chinese programmer equivalent today was like starving to death somewhere, okay, because their economies were ruined, right? In China's case by civil war and so on, India's case by eventually by socialism and, and whatnot. And, um, and of course, uh, the Soviet Union and, and, the West, and the Eastern Bloc were all under communism, right? So all these other countries were held back by communism and socialism, and that's why the West was able to uh, advance. 
and stay relatively out of war. The U.S. was able to stay out of war. Obviously, the West wasn't able to stay out of war, but the U.S. was relatively able to be unscathed by war. It's a better way of putting it. The U.S. is involved in a lot of wars, but it, it the, the motherland doesn't get blown up by them. It's not touched. It's a TV war where you see it on TV, but it's not like Kansas is getting blown up, right? So India should be, I, I'm not saying India should be in lots of wars, but India should definitely make sure it doesn't come back. There is a narrative that war boosts economies. Oh my God. <laughs> that, that's that's one of the narratives that's been brought up on the show as well. But it causes too much suffering in the world on a human level. It's a word to, like, okay. So the thing is, this is the broken windows fallacy. Have you heard the broken windows? No. Okay. So Bastiat has this concept. It's like, um, let's say you've got a, a store and somebody smashes a window. Okay. Then the store owner has to spend money on getting the window repaired. Okay, so you see economic activity. He's employing the glazier and so on, right? But that's actually so he would have spent that money on something else, mm. right? That's you're you're seeing the activity and you're saying that's wealth creation. Actually, smashing the window is wealth destruction. And instead, the store owner would have uh, built a new wing to his store if he didn't have to, you know, fix this window, right? So war breaks windows, kills people. It's literally wealth destroying. The problem is people don't understand the difference. And sometimes we speak about it casually. I'm sure earlier in the video I spoke about it casually. But the difference between like money and wealth, did you know the distinction? Have you heard that before? Mm, I mean, for me, wealth is a lot more than just money. Yeah. Well, so like prosperity. Another, right. So another way of putting it is the difference between like better might, might be between money versus like goods and services. Sure. Okay. For example, uh, if I give you, um, you know, a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill and you give me an iPhone back, right? Money in a voluntary transaction usually tra travels opposite the direction of wealth, right? The good or service goes this way, right? And you have the money, but I have the, the good or service. That's usually what happens. And we count that part of the transaction, but this part is not usually conceptualized and such. And so the thing is though, if you then blew this up and all we had was the dollar bill, then we'd be poorer off, right? We'd, we'd all be poor. So war destroys that. The only thing that war does do, which is true, is um, it does force people to work harder, okay? But that's because it's like a tax, right? It says, okay, um, Work or die, mm. right? Because if you don't work really hard and you don't focus on the war effort, you might literally get blown up and imprisoned and so on and so forth. So work or die, right? So in that sense, the people who are into war are like, oh, yeah, we had this wartime production and so on and so forth. Because people are essentially um, being told they'll, they'll lose their lives. It's like slavery in a sense, right, uh, where they have to do it. They don't really have a choice, or else they die. So it's a it's a destruction of freedom, right? It's a little bit like conscription. That's an area of putting it, right? Um, rather than being conscripted into the military to fight, you're conscripted into the economy to build for the fight. Gotcha. Okay, so that's not good. That's mm. actually it's a, the kind of thing where there's a ton of propaganda that accompanies it to make you feel like it's good, but it's not good. Okay. Okay. <sighs> I don't have more questions uh, about okay. about war in okay, general okay, okay. Uh, because this is pretty much the end of the episode. Okay. Now I'll speak a little bit. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to learn today, man. Like I've not had too many guests where I just shut up and listen. Like, uh, and you're one of them. And this was my game plan with you. Okay. After listening to all the podcasts you've done on Lex Friedman, Tim Ferriss. Firstly, it's like a big uh, checkpoint moment for me that you're on my show. You're in my house. <laughs> okay. Uh, and trust me, for all the Twitter nerds out there, like having you on their podcast is like a big life moment. Um, I didn't want to interrupt you. I wanted you to like burst my bubbles because I have formed bubbles because of the people I've met on the show. And I think as a podcaster, over time, you keep getting better because your guest's energy rubs off on you. Hmm. So that's what this was for me. Like it challenged me at many points, but it also taught me a lot. I didn't want to interrupt you at that's all. That's fine. Sure. Great. I usually have a content game plan in mind with people, but you had no content game plan. I just sat in front of you and I wanted to listen and learn. Let me, let me float something with you and you tell me if I'm right, right. Sure. The thing is that because most of your guests are Indians from within India. Well, what that means is um, they're either, they're often either very critical of where India is right now, or they're very pro-India to the point that they're like, the rupee will become a huge global currency and 
um, you know, like no limits to Barth and, and so on and so forth. Right? They're very, they're very booster or they're very, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think that's is that a, wrong? a big part of urban India now. Right. Where half of it is very anti Modi. I won't say half. Right. A big chunk is very anti Modi. Sure. And an even larger chunk is very pro Modi. Sure. The thing is within that pro Modi chunk, everyone's grown up in the nineties and eighties and seventies. So there are very middle-class Indian values, uh, a big middle-class Indian value is a slight amount of humility that will always be there in your heart. So I don't think anyone has ever come okay. up and said that the rupee will be the number one thing, but we're a very ambitious country when it comes to making number three or number two. No one's okay, really okay, said- Okay, okay, okay. So then, then I'm wrong with that because there is a friend of mine who I know who is such an Indian nationalist that, and he's a good guy, okay? He'll know who exactly who he is when, I'm, when I refer to him. But he's, like, he's such an Indian nationalist that, he, that, you know, when I tell him, I'm like, look, India is not going to be number one. So therefore, the rupee won't be a global currency. You might be able to use it for bilateral trades, yeah. but it's not going to be the next global reserve. He's like, no limits. Why are you, you want to, you need to decolonize your mentality. The mm. rupee is going to be, I'm like, oh, come on, dude, have a realistic goal on something. There's other things where India can actually be number one on. So that was kind of what I meant where there's a certain, so maybe I'm wrong with that. I'm miscalibrating. Maybe it's just that guy. Okay. Is it Patrick Bed David? Because no, he no, does no. a lot of pro-India stuff. No, no, no. Well, that's the thing is the Americans who are pro-India are, I, look, it's, it will, you should, we should take it, you should book it, you should be happy with it and so on, but realize that it's like very fair weather type stuff mm. where it is, um, for example, you know this movie called Red Dawn? No. Okay. Red Dawn, it's a famous uh, American, very American movie, Okay about the early 80s about a supposed uh, Russian Cuban invasion of the USA where they you know surprise attack with nukes and the hell uh, you know the the paratroopers land and you know everybody is speaking Russian and whatever <laughs> right and um, it, there's an opening scene where the guy says you know but who's with us uh, and he's like um, 200 million screaming Chinamen and he's like I thought there was 600 million screaming Chinamen. He's like, there was, because they also got nuked or whatever, right? But the point is basically, I'm probably getting the numbers wrong. It's like 400 million or 200 million. The point is at that time, China, even though it was communist, was like spoken of respectfully as an American ally mm. against the Soviets by the early 80s that had updated enough that even this very sort of like low IQ reference to the Chinese was not negative. Mm. because So that's what I mean. So then they were fine, right? Mm. And for a long time, the Chinese were fine. And suddenly they became public enemy number one. In fact, you can look at the opinion polls and it looks like this, 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 and then zoop like this after 2019, mm. you know? So just as long as India just knows that it's very, nothing against Patrick but David or anybody like that. I don't know, him, you know, but um, it's just very fair weather. So book the money, book the deals, so get the deal signed, and this is at the individual level, this is at the company level, this is at the country level. Book all the deals, get the deal signed, have India live up to its part of the bargain, over deliver on that part. Just assume that the contract re-up may not even be there in like a year or two years. For example, it looks like there might be, you see what's happened with Poland, it's just pulling support for Ukraine, mm. right? Ukraine was the number one thing, blah, blah, last year, and now it's yesterday's news. So, you know, and building value in a continuous way is a way to ensure that you just stay in business and you don't take all this American tension and be like oh, our bestest friend forever, right? Mm. Maybe gone tomorrow. Go ahead. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. at least my listeners, I'm sure are aware of that. Okay. There, but there, I just want to emphasize it's ridiculously important. The most important thing. Yeah. Go, go, go. There is a, I mean, I, I don't want to use the word dislike, but there is this like cautionary caution. emotion. Yeah. People have that caution when it comes to America. Caution is the right yeah. word, right? Because of America's track record. Exactly. Having some degree of memory is the is honestly your like like just having the memory of more than a goldfish, right? right? Knowing what's happened, just knowing the history for the last twenty years mm. is really important because they don't want you to remember anything beyond what is happening right now, and you're supposed to react to the emotions of the moment today and forget about everything that happened in the past, right? That is, there's an enormous push on that. That that is the strategy at the current moment, right? The current thing is to make you aware of only the current thing, gotcha. and and the way it works is because. 5,000 people are tweeting about the same thing at the same time. So it does feel like that's the only important thing in the world, but it's so 
evanescent fleeting it's so fleeting yeah all right that's it that's the episode balaji shrinivas and that's the conversation we're going to split this into two episodes because Great. there's no way i can release i think a 4 hour conversation was it really 4 i think so 3 okay, right. and a half 4 right. hours uh honestly for me one of my intentions here was to introduce you to my audiences there's a lot of people within my audience who haven't seen your work with lex friedman or with tim ferris uh so i met like an american friend once and he said that we know you guys have a big population in india but we also know that the urban and the interiors of the country are two different sections and we never know how to reach out to the interiors mm. uh so the urban indians can actually help kind of bridge the gap between the two and right. that's the kind of motive i had with this episode that's great so thank you for opening up but i promise you the next time we'll go even deeper and uh, there'll be a lot more cross questioning sounds good uh you checkpoint for me in my own podcasting career all right uh, i hope you had fun Balaji Shri Vasa. Very a lot of fun. Great. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. See you soon, man. Okay. Thank you so much. That was the two part conversation. This was one of the most fun conversations for me even though I was just sitting there and listening. I know that Balaji Shri Vasan is going to be back on TRS. There's so much more to discuss with him. I wanted to keep the introductory episodes centered around geopolitics because that's what my audience is used to but i'd love to speak about technology i'd love to speak about other aspects of the modern world other aspects of the future so please tell me what you thought of these two episodes in the comment section please tell me about what you'd like me to speak about with balaji s the next time he's in mumbai lots of love Make sure you check out the massive library of topics that we've already covered on TRS. And until next time, from Ranveer and the team, we will see you later.